Welcome to the European Solidarity Center. We are at the historical Gdańsk shipyard, a place that shaped European cultural heritage. Solidarność was born here, a peaceful revolution that started in the summer of 1980 to democratize Poland and change the political order of our continent. The modern European Solidarity Center headquarters was opened in August 2014. Its meaningful architecture is inspired by the shipyard industry as it resembles a ship under construction. It was crucial to open this building together with the permanent exhibition as it truly influences, explains and inspires all our activities. The European Solidarity Center is a unique institution a museum as well as a modern agora, gathering people who feel responsible for modern solidarity and democracy. Public space that attracts families and activists, scientists and students, witnesses and political leaders alike. The heart of the ECS is this permanent exhibition dedicated to the history of Polish Solidarność, while telling a story of the changes in Central and Eastern Europe. We try to bring together various political and historical perspectives on modern Polish history. Over 5 million people have visited the European Solidarity Center in Gdańsk since the opening in 2014. Well, the ECS is now one of the most popular museums in Poland and Central Europe. Our permanent exhibition documents anti-communist revolutions in Central and Eastern Europe from the Baltic States to Albania, from Germany to Russia, from Poland to Bulgaria. The exhibition in our center connects Polish history with the destiny of our nations. This is why our guests from all over the world immerse themselves in the history of Solidarność, Solidarity. We are very proud to be honored with the European Heritage Award, Europa Nostra Award 2021, and to contribute to history and cultural diversity represented by the laureates from all over Europe. Thank you for your trust. We hope to meet you soon here in Gdańsk. Oh, me? <laughs> okay. Well, um, it was a quite unconventional start here. <laughs> Uh, welcome at the European Solidarity Center. This was a very short film, two minutes, three minutes, that we made, well, four weeks ago, five weeks ago. Uh, it is, well, um, a presentation of our institution in the context of the European Heritage Award, Europa Nostra. And we got the award for, well, as an institution that tries to translate ideas uh, into well current challenges, so heritage as um, means not um, material heritage but but ideas, and it was yes a quite interesting change for us to uh, to characterize this institution to show also the the subjects that 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 are our main uh, topic. So welcome here in in this library that is also symbolizing um, history. And the future, this is a library dedicated not only to the history of Solidarność, not only to the history of the breakdown of communism to communist, but also it's a place um, uh, of um, ref philosophical reflection about human rights, about democracy. And you find here also a lot of literature about the current uh, global challenges. And this is a very prominent also place in Poland to organize public debates, TV debates. Um, yes, I'm very happy that we got now the chance to uh, to organize this conference because this is the thir third experience, yes? <laughs> third, um, third one. Um, it is fascinating that this conference was designed before the pandemia. It looks like it was designed yesterday, <laughs> created yesterday. Because as we know, the main topic is how to communicate, how to connect people in, in this time of pandemia. Technology is very important, World Wide Web is very important, but we are also discussing the impact of this virtual 
world um, on um, on public spaces on people um, and on the other side we are also experiencing as conventional places of um, of um, um, meetings how important real life and real places are this is also a very important experience since of the last well six weeks four six weeks because we reopened this house in May, yes, mid-May. So, um, for these reasons, I'm very grateful for the idea to organize such a conference because it is dedicated well to, to the main questions also for our team uh, for the development of this house. Once again, we are here at a very historical, very important, symbolical place, the former Gdańsk shipyard. We are in the heart of Gdańsk. Um, some of you had the chance to visit the exhibition together with Jacek. So we tried not only to reconstruct um, the great Polish solidarity revolution um, and the heritage of democratic opposition in Poland, but what is very important this year, because we will commemorate this year the 13th anniversary of, anniversary of the breakdown of the Soviet empire, is that we tried to document also other traditions of anti-totalitarian opposition uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. And this is very important because we are talking a lot in Europe about, uh, well, a European commemoration, European memory. But uh, I would say m the traditional museums, also the modern museums, in, not only in Poland, all over Europe, are very focused on regional, local, and national traditions. We often don't try to, to, to show contexts and show also the impact of other uh, traditions and developments of our history. So we are, I, I, I would say, looking at, at Jacek, we are very, very proud um, that we also tried to, to show how important, well, other people, other societies, are, how brave also other nations well, because um, um, at the starting point of this um, work, of this exhibition, was also the idea that the breakdown started here. Gdańsk is very important. Poland is very important. Yes, Gdańsk is very important. Solidarność was very specific as one of the greatest social movement with movements with 10 million people. But history is much more complex. Uh, dynamics have different sources. And this is something what is won wonderful and great, universal. So this is, I would say, a very specific impact of this house. And, and last uh, question, sentence is, um, I would say 60, 70 percent of our program is dedicated to, to current challenges. And I would say these are not specific Polish questions. So this is the question of how democracy is developing because also of uh, the impact of technology, uh, global economy, uh, what does it mean for, for local communities, national communities, but also what does it mean for the global development. So, um, and we are very happy that it is possible to uh, connect these perspectives in, in an institution that um, is also very popular. And, and our guests, the majority of our guests are not, ex not experts, but people um, who are, yes, responsible for our civil society. Once again, welcome here. Uh, thank you very much to Mrs. Manikowska for this idea um, to create such an event here, to start a dialogue here in Gdańsk. And I'm very grateful, uh, first of all, to our guests from uh, outside of Poland. We have guests from Canada. Welcome, <laughs> very warmly from the Netherlands, from uh, Germany, but I'm also very, very happy that we have colleagues from all around pro Poland, from the south, from uh, Krakow, Oświęcim, uh, Opole, Warsaw, so a great pluralism of experiences and perspectives. So thank you very much for coming, and I'm yes, very happy that we will be together these two wonderful days here in Gdańsk. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, I also join congratulations and thank you, Eva, for being with us and for coming to us with the idea of organizing the conference. It's the first time we try to do it. <laughs> but for the first time, we are uh, certain at least uh, our panelists could come to Gdansk and be with us uh, on site and not online, which uh, makes a significant difference uh, in a way how to deal, how we deal with, with the topic, how we can discuss the topics and, uh, and uh, develop questions which are crucial for, uh, uh, for uh, museums and technologies, this strange but f fascinating combination of two di dimensions we, we have to challenge today. Um, because uh, those who could not be with us today uh, are online, I would love to, to say a few words about the European Solidarity Center. We, we uh, have seen the, uh, um, we have seen the, uh, uh, the two minutes uh, uh, short film presenting the activities of the European Solidarity Center. Um, but what I would like to show you is also to show the building and the concept beside it. Can we start the presentation? Yeah, okay. okay. So the building has a form of a ship um, and we are at the very heart of the, of the Gdańsk shipyard. And because we deal with the topic of solidarity trade union, but also one of the greatest movements, social movements of the late 20th century. We deal with the late industrial age. Solidarity movement was one of the last biggest industrial, late industrial revolutions in the world history. Um, uh, an organization and a movement that, that uh, um, mobilized uh, about 10 million people actively in, engaged in creating the trade unionism in Poland. It was almost every second member of Polish society that joined the movement uh, and created this kind of total social movement representing all groups of Polish society. When we compare it with Mahatma Gandhi movement, with Martin Luther King movement, with Nelson Mandela movement, that's the that's the, the scale of mobilization and the impact on the history of, of continent of the region. So the building uh, represents not only the history of, of solidarity movement, but at the same time, uh, it represents also the history of, uh, of uh, industry, of creating ships at the very site where the building had been uh, had been created uh, and opened 2014, so we are a pretty young institution. As you can see, it's made of cartoon, a uh, very popular material in modern architecture, but it has to uh, take a look uh, uh, like a ship in development. I do believe in, in a way it's a metaphor of social solidarity or forms of solidarity that are, I mean, always you know, a challenge to create, to reframe, to redefine, to find a new new forms that, that fit into the challenges we have to face today. So I do believe this kind of metaphor beside this architectural project is uh, a very good um, uh, direction in which we try to <laughs> move also our activities at the European Solidarity Center. Mm. So now from this perspective, you can see that the building has a form of a ship. There are similarities to a ship that is under construction, but the facade that is a little bit broken shows how dynamic the historical process is and the architectural concept tries to express the dynamic of the revolution that took place in the 80s in Poland and, and had a big impact on the entire region. To the long-term goals of the European Solidarity Center belong commemorating, preserving, popularizing the heritage and idea of solidarity and the anti-communist democratic opposition in Poland and other countries. So we are not only, although we are focused on, on the history of solidarity movement and the 
let's say, development in Poland, we are at the same time very much interest, uh, interested and engaged in what happened in the entire region. So we read the history of solidarity as a part of universal freedom history that had its fascinating uh, expression from the 40s until the beginning of the 90s in Central and Eastern Europe. The second goal is to inspire new universal cultural civic union, local government, national European initiative based on these values. That's the reason why uh, European Solidarity Center is a cultural institution using uh, the language of the museum as a, as a part of its activity, but we are cooperating with NGOs who can use the infrastructure of the European Solidarity Center for their own purposes. Uh, that are, of course, connected with the main idea of solidarity and democratic activism. The third goal is to share the uh, attainments of peaceful fights for freedom, justice, democracy, and human rights with those who are deprived of it. And the fourth one is to participate actively in the development of the European identity and new international order. That's the reason why it's not only a Polish solidarity center. We do believe this history, this, this story, this narrative we try to tell here belongs to the European history uh, in, it, in its core. We are also very proud to get international recognition in 2006. I mean, we've got the European Heritage Labour showing the importance of the solidarity uh, history for the uh, European integration, when we take a look at the history of Europe from the broader perspective, then it's visible how important these processes that took place after 45, after the Second World War in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, how important it, uh, they were for, for the uh, uh, European integration, not only for the region. We are also very proud to get the Museum Prize 2016 from the Council of Europe, uh, which was a, a very important moment for the entire team uh, uh, waiting for the, <laughs> for the voice of the recognition from the side of, of the visitors of, uh, of the international organizations uh, uh, for which the, uh, the heritage plays a very important role. And we are also very proud to get uh, this year the European Heritage Award, Europa Nostra Award uh, 2021, uh, which makes us more than happy. <laughs> um, you see, it's a, uh, uh, you know, in, in times without pandemic restrictions, it's a very, it's, it's a place where everyday life is full of tensions. We have many visitors every year, almost one million visitors visiting the European Solidarity Center and taking part in the public activities of the institution there, institutions uh, using the infrastructure for their own purposes. Um, uh, you could see this uh, historical part. Uh, we are very much interested in, in the historical heritage of the industrial age. We are very much interested to, to preserve and to present as a part, important part of the political and social history. So here you see the um, pictures from one of the rooms uh, being a part of, of the permanent exhibition. Uh, another room deals with, uh, with the peaceful, non-violent philosophy of solidarity and the round table talks is the symbolically very intensive moment showing how hard uh, it is to meet the, uh, the enemies and how, uh, how crucial it is to make a common talk possible on work on how hard it is to, to work on the consensus and, uh, and a deal that could be acceptable for uh, both sides of the, of the conflict. Um, so we understand, as uh, Basil Kersky already have said, we understand solidarity as part of the, uh, of the freedom history of the region and perhaps the synthesis of the non-violent philosophy that has been developed, especially in the 70s uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, 
thanks to many oppositional organizations from Czechoslovakia, from GDR, from Hungary, from Romania, Bulgaria, all the countries that created the Eastern Bloc and had to share a very hard experience living under the, the authoritarian regime. But we also deal with the present, so it's extremely important for us to create space for being together, for, uh, for exercising uh, uh, cooperation and social trust. On the photo you see uh, little children uh, gathering together and playing a game which is possible to play only when you ask your friend or your colleague. Uh, which you meet accidentally uh, to join you and to have a fun of uh, moving some parts of the game and, uh, and at the same time cooperating in a very natural way. So what it's important for us is just to show that it's very hard to live without solidarity within society, but at the same time it's to show that how beautiful and how natural to cooperation and ensure social trust is in, in everyday life relationships. So uh, in this way, we would love to welcome you one day at the European Solidarity Center. Uh, we do hope one day uh, when the uh, pandemic restrictions are over, there will be a chance uh, to, to visit the European Solidarity Center. Feel welcome, Gdańsk is waiting for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me present you very shortly uh, the second organizer of this co-organizer of this conference uh, with this uh, strange acronym DigiConflict <laughs> and uh, the idea and uh, behind this conference. So DigiConflict is uh, a research consortium uh, of uh, free research teams from Sweden, United Kingdom and Poland. Uh, Sweden is Lee Shopping University, United Kingdom it is uh, De Montfort uh, University, and in Poland it's like a consortium of a small NGO called Liber Pro Arte. <laughs> so we are in the library very well. <laughs> and uh, my home institute, that is the Institute of Art of the Polish Academy of Sciences, and the law department of the University of Opole. And uh, we, this is a research consortium in the framework of an EU program uh, that is called the Joint Initiative. Um, oh my God, uh, uh, for the promo of jo Joint Programming Initiative uh, on Cultural Heritage. Uh, and what we are researching is uh, the increasing role digital heritage plays in public framings and interpretations of the past. And today we are inaugurating the second uh, of the DigiConflict conferences because each of our teams uh, has organized or will organize a conference uh, springing from uh, its uh, main research topic. So uh, the first conference was organized in 2018 in Stockholm, also at the museum, at the Nordic Museum, which is a very old, a very traditional museum uh, which, which was founded in the 19th, well back in the 19th century, but now which is facing very contemporary issues and problems like what to do with the heritage of migrants. So, uh, and this conference was dedicated to issues of oral history as the Swedish team was looking mainly at oral history. However, we ended up talking very much about museums and asking questions which still need responses, don't have responses to it, not only in Poland, but also in Sweden, US, and so on. So basic problems like ethical issues in making digital born heritage made available online, mm -hmm. or should we collect, how to collect and what to collect of social media, and so on and so on. And this conference, which as already was mentioned, was initially scheduled for 2020, for April 2020, so it was canceled at the last minute, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and was for obviously was postponed for like a follow-up of this Nordic Museum uh, conference and springs from the research conducted by the Polish team because we have focused on museums and on this Polish phenomenon of a narrative museum of which the European Solidarity Center, which telling the truth is not a museum, a cultural institution, is a perfect, but it is a perfect example. 
uh, and I could not imagine a more appropriate venue for such a conference than the European Solidarity Centre. I'm very grateful <laughs> for hosting us here. Uh, its narrative exhibition uh, has just, as already has been said, has just been awarded with the European Heritage Award, so it's the Europa Nostra Award, for its role in the popularization of human rights, labor, and political rights, and for the role played by civic engagement. And as already mentioned, and this is very important, in 2016, it was the first Polish institution to be awarded this um, Council of Europe Museum Prize, and we, I, I, I quote for what? Fascinating example of a cultural institution working to promote freedom and solidarity. Uh, and uh, it really makes its program, events, exhibition altogether, makes of it, uh, of the European Solidarity Center, a form, forum for contemporary Europe and contemporary Poland. And it also must be added that this conference was also conceived as a comment and contribution to the recent important discussion over the new notion of the museum institution that would speak the language of the 20th century. So I really like, very much like this logo where we have this <laughs> sign of the museum and you can ask if the sign is still appropriate for the museum and it really fits <laughs> this <laughs> scanning. <laughs> uh, and it's not only about the digital because the museum institution is changing. So uh, it's a discussion that took place, a very fiery discussion that took place and is far from being resolved at the International Council of Museum General Assembly in Kyoto because it was a new definition proposed by the um, International Council of Museum Board uh, and scheduled for a vote, which has been postponed, whether to include it or not in the ICOM status. And I, as I know it, I think it will be 22 uh, that it will be voted but we don't know, there's a big Pharisee discussion going on. <laughs> so we aim at, by, uh, at introducing into this discussion an important mm -hmm. acknowledge. It was acknowledged, but you cannot really fit it in the, in, the, in the definition, but arguably marginalized aspect, the role of technology, determinant, tool, this is like a question that we, we, we have to uh, answer somehow, of the changes signaled by the new definition uh, occurring in the museum institution in our century. And notwithstanding the criticism of the definition, it was a very big criticism because you have so many museums, so many different museums, traditional museums don't understand narrative museums and vice versa and so on. Uh, and uh, also like uh, it was criticized from ideological perspectives. Um, we must say that this new definition nevertheless reflects in an array of important changes in museum practices around the world. And in particular, it also reflects the narrative museum <laughs> in a way. So let's remind the new definition that provides that museums are democratizing, inclusive, and polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue about the past and the futures. Moreover, they safeguard diverse memories for future generation and guarantee equal rights and equal access to heritage for all people. And I'm also, of, of course, cutting a bit. Uh, they are participatory and transparent and work in active partnership with and for diverse communities to collect, preserve, research, interpret, exhibit, enhance understandings of the world aiming to contribute to human dignity, social justice, global equality, and planetary well-being. So, uh, indeed, the core aims of a museum institution framed in the new terms do describe and justify the wide application of the fast evolving digital technologies and means. Nowadays, a common place, and with the pandemics, even a more common place in the, uh, in the uh, new museums, both in the new museums and the traditional ones. Though technology in the museum context is considered as an obvious mean of making the museum more open, reachable to the public, so we are very reachable to the public today. <laughs> so everyone can see us around the world. We didn't dream of this, <laughs> but organizing this workshop, it was conceived as a workshop conference for Polish scholars and practitioners in the first place. Um, and um, it is a tool of democratization, uh, which uh, guarantees broad access to culture, heritage, education. And with the mean of technology, the museum institution is able to engage younger generation, which are for, for whom already the uh, in internet and World Wide Web tools are a commonplace and technology. So, um, so, and what is also important, it's, it's able also to tackle important issues and important heritage issues of the past, of the present, important for today's societies. 
So, but what is important, this conference will not follow the mainstream of a vivid worldwide discussion around museum and digitization, centered on how to keep at pace with a full and fully exploit the rapidly changing information and communication technologies. We will also not uh, touch, or maybe, maybe in the discussion, <laughs> in the final discussion, on the current and widely debated issue of the coronavirus global pandemic and on its impact on the growing role and place of technology in contemporary museums. So our start is the narrative museum and the new museum definition. Instead, it will aim at signaling the dangers and challenges brought by the digital turn and discuss in a wider framework of changes which are occurring in memory institutions and in the way cultural heritage is managed, framed and enjoyed. It is divided into three sessions. The first one, entitled The Museum Institution in the 20th Century, will discuss technology, and will be just on the background, technology will be just on the background of these discussions, of three important research streams and phenomena shaping currently the museum and memory institutions the concepts and culture of sustainability, so a wider look also in the context of the planet, <laughs> not only of heritage, past and future, but of the planet, that's for first. Uh, and here we have a new discipline of heritage science coming in. Uh, then um, a quite critical approach to the museum's colonial past and colonial collections. So we are looking at what the museum, at the, at the collection, at what is tangible, and, uh, and this is like one of the most important debates going on right now in uh, museology and museums, and uh, it is really shaped by another important regional trend, which is colonial studies, and the human rights approach to cultural heritage. Nowadays, like we are talking about cultural rights, and again, another important impact, the impact on law, <laughs> on how we look at museums and collections. Of course, this panel is far from being comprehensive, so we are omitting such important issues shaping contemporary museums as globalization, uh, the rising living standards in developing countries, the 20th century, 21st century global expansions and ever rising popularity of museums, economic aspects and so on. But of course, it is impossible to touch everything. And I think the three streams just spring uh, are the basis of the new museum definitions. That's why I chose them. And I think they are, they're not really, really considered together. <laughs> so the second panel, in the second panel, it's like it uh, springs from the interest in the narrative museum. So we are looking at the impact of digital technologies on education and exhibition. Ask how digital technologies have changed the way museums operate in achieving their mission and what challenges uh, it has put in front of them. And uh, springing from our research on narrative museums, uh, we have dedicated uh, and decided to focus in particular on issues and exhibition and education. And we will be asking such questions, okay, how do museums and narrative and uh, exhibitions and uh, digital technologies operate uh, in a, like, let's say, environment, legal and operational environment, which is really fit still for the, uh, for the analog reality, not digital reality. This is a very big problem. And the third panel, Memory Turning Museums, considers technology in the focus of memory studies, which have strongly influenced the museum institution in the 21st century, in particular in Poland. We, while this panel will contribute to an important debate on the role played by and challenges related to technology and digitization in Holocaust remembers and education in the post-witness era, uh, it must be stressed, of course, that memory is a crucial category when we are speaking of uh, museums and we are defining it. Museums are about memory and remembering and memorializing. And at the same time, the internet, uh, of course, is a completely new type uh, of a memorizing tool, uh, which not only duplicates all the previous ones, but enables the user to retrieve an incomparably uh, greater quality of data to do it much quicker and to give virtual access to almost everybody. So uh, this is like the third panel. Uh, and I would like also to welcome everyone and thank everyone for sticking to this conference for such a long time. I'm so happy. And also welcome with our participants online. Um, and just to say that I feel a bit strange because I'm an art historian and let's say this is the 19th century uh, <laughs> curriculum of a museum professional. And now <laughs> I will be speaking with uh, our speakers, among our speakers we have historians, we have anthropologists, we have uh, physi uh, 
physicist, <laughs> yes, not to say physician, <laughs> physicist, uh, we have lawyers, uh, so, so it is like, it, it also shows how much the museum is changing. So welcome also to all our uh, online and uh, on-site uh, public, uh, and I hope you we'll enjoy this uh, two days and we'll have a very nice ending discussion that maybe will contribute a bit to this <laughs> new definition of the, of the museum. There is a chance to ask the questions on the internet, which is uh, very important for us because we'll try to, uh, to, to, to ask it for you uh, during the debates. And perhaps the most important thing is thank you to our technical team, to Zuzanna Marcinczyk, Radosław Janiec, and all my colleagues who made it uh, this technical meeting on-site and online available. You are great. Thank you very much for, for making it available for us. <laughs> but now it's time for the first panel, Eva, so I leave you here and we will make uh, a space for our colleagues and our guests. Okay, so uh, I have already introduced the first panel. No, 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 maybe I'll just ask you one by one. It will be, yes, it will be easier. Uh, and I will start right away by uh, inviting here uh, Łukasz Bratas. Um, uh, just give you the... Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Who is our physicist? <laughs> yes, he is professor of heritage science at the Jerzy Harbor Institute of Catalyst and Surface Chemistry of the Polish Academy of Sciences. He works in a very serious institution uh, in Krakow, in Poland. Uh, he is the former head of the Sustainable Conservation Lab at the U Yale University. And he has also served uh, as director of a laboratory of analysis and non-destructive investigation of heritage objects of the National Museum of Krakow. And currently, among his numerous projects that he's conducting, he's the leader of the Horizon 2020 collection care project and of the bilateral Polish-Norwegian Krakalur <laughs> Greek project funded by the Norwegian grant. And he has gained uh, recognition by Yale University for works on energy efficiency in museums and libraries, as well uh, as the grand prize of European Union uh, for Cultural Heritage, Europa Nostra Award. We have many awardees here among our guests <laughs> for his uh, research project, NOAS ARC. So, Łukasz, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, welcome, everyone. And, Eva, thank you, for, uh, first of all, for invitation. I'm privileged. But also, I have to say that I'm fascinated that you are so brave to invite physicists to the <laughs> conference of the, uh, in the museum. And as Eva mentioned, I graduated, I did my PhD in pure physics, and then my, I did my uh, habilitation degree and professor title in physics, because there is, but in fact, I'm the heritage scientist. In Poland, there is, there is no heritage science as a discipline yet, but heritage science exists in other countries. And I think that is slowly uh, rising new discipline. And I would like during my presentation to convince you that heritage science, first of all, to, that it exists, and secondly, that it's fascinating field of study. And what heritage science is, is it a science which applies the uh, tools typical for uh, natural sciences, for the life sciences, for the engineering, to answer the questions which are posed by humanities, represented by the history of art, by conservation, by archaeology, and so on. Uh, so I think that it's easy, it would be easy to convince you that heritage science exists in the media because there is a coverage uh, frequently appears uh, when some scientists discover some fascinating uh, think in the works of art, for example. And I'm showing my friend David Thorogood from the island of Tasmania, who is showing the oldest beer in the world. The oldest means that it's produced by the oldest yeast, because yeast are the organisms which evolve very quickly. So when we drink beer now, it's a different beer than we drank 20 years ago. And uh, he's showing this yeast because it happened that, uh, that, that the ship which was transporting the, the beer to Tasmania just sank at the coast of the Tasmania and it was drowning the cold waters and the, 
yeast were hibernated, and when it was now extracted, excavated, they could make this yeast again producing the, the beer. So it is a rare example how our heritage science has also impact on the economy, but the oldest beer in the world is produced on Tasmania. I think that it's also uh, more frequently that politician, but we also, we realize that heritage is important not only for the quality of life of the society, but it's also important for the economy and particularly for the tourist industry. These are quite old data, but uh, the, the tourism industry generates or cultural heritage uh, uh, generates around more than three billions of of uh, euro in, in Europe, which is particularly rich in the cultural heritage objects. It off, it's offering nine million jobs in euros. The Europe uh, tourist industry generates directly 4% of European GDP and indirectly 11% of GDP. Uh, the conservation market in itself, it's worth five billion euros, euros uh, as well. So when we look at the structure of the of this heritage sector because the heritage science exists because the, the heritage as a sector exists. And of course the heritage industry is uh, founded on the heritage assets, which of course include museums, collections, libraries, archives, monuments, sites, all tangible heritage, but also intangible and digital as well. And it is linked with the heritage industry through the policy and the financing and professional networks. And of course, um, uh, heritage industry uh, incorporates services, enterprises, but also research. And I think it's quite obvious that uh, research were existing in this field for the very long time. It was represented by archeology, span art history, conservation, but heritage science, there is even not good expression in Poland, we translate it as a nauka o uh, but this is a new development. Each important sector of economy needs to have the, its, its science, because the heritage resources are non-recoverable resources, and we have to manage them in the very responsible way, as we do with other uh, non-recoverable uh, resources. And heritage, heritage science, the first, for the first time, the term appeared during the, when the report of House of Lords, Science and Heritage was published in 2006. We have our uh, conferences on heritage science. We exist in the media. We are present there. We have national networks for heritage science. In Poland, we have the Research Infrastructure Association for Heritage Science where universities and Polish Academy of Sciences are offering tools for the museums and for the other memory institutions. And finally, we have our journals. Only one thing which we don't have and other disciplines do uh, is literacy canon. We don't have that yet, but we are emerging discipline. And when you think about the discipline, 70 years ago, there was care for environment, but there was no uh, environmental science, but now you have environmental sciences at each university. Uh, 30 years ago, there was care for elderly people, but there was no science about that. Now we have geriatriology, which is the science about aging of, of people, and heritage science is the same. We had, we care for the heritage, but now we have the heritage heritage science. And when we look at the structure of the, or let's say how to position this, this type of the science, this discipline, let's look at the Stokes quadrant, which posi positions different type of the, of the sciences. And on the left side, you have see uh, the important criterion, which is the quest from the fundamental understanding of the, of the universe and it's represented mainly by the fundamental research. For example, it's called Bohr quadrant. Bohr was interested in the structure of atom. He was not interested in the use, in the direct application. And on the X axis, on the vertical axis, we have also a criteria of the consideration of use. And it is represented, this is represented by applied research and, uh, uh, and in this case, the Edison, we call it Edison Quadrant. Edison was 
particularly interesting in solving the practical problems. And we have the third quadrant, which is called pastor quadrant, uh, pastor quadrant, which is use in inspired basic research. And heritage science is mainly located here, but of course it's also applied type of the sciences. Particularly, I'm working on the cracking of painting because I want to, or, or other objects, physical damage of, of works of art, and I want to preserve them, but it lead us to the question why we observe such a different crackle patterns in different types of the paintings. Even when you go to the museum and you listen to the curator or conservator, they speak about the color, they speak about uh, the composition, but they never say a word about the crackalors because even we don't have language to describe these crackalors and to explain why we observe different types of the crackalors. And when we try to identify the strategic research directions, we can, in heritage science, we can define two. One is the creation of the new information, and it was always represented by archometry, palometry, technological investigation of works of art, but now the new tendency is to, is, or new direction is the heritage computing or neuroscience in heritage. On the other hand, we have research leading to better preservation of value of, of objects, and it was always represented by traditional conservation, uh, heritage preservation and management, and now what is new, we have to do that, but also in very sustainable way. And I think this link is very important. When we try to preserve the value, we have to understand what does it mean. And so far, we don't have very objective tools how to measure that. And I think that neurosciences can help about that, in that. And I think I will try to convince you that we need development in this area of, of the research. So uh, particularly, as, I, as Eva mentioned, I'm interested in sustainable preservation of the cultural heritage resource. And generally, we call it sustainable uh, conservation, sustainable uh, preservation. And it can, could be considered as a special form of the cost-benefit management of the cultural heritage, whose goal is to minimize loss of the value of the cultural heritage resource. And it was always the paradigm of the conservation, but now is a new thing. We have to do that at the given financial environmental and social costs. I think it's very important to convince young generation or at least to give them justification why we are preserving one value, which is the cultural heritage, and we are doing that at the other cost, social or uh, environmental. If you don't do that, you can have situation as here on this graph, which shows uh, more than uh, energy con normalized energy consumption to the cubic meter in se more than 70 museums all over the world. This is my private, on the left side you have my private database, there is a, a UK database, there is Arab Construction Company, which is the largest company for building museums from, uh, from United States. You have building performance database of the, in the United States and the data uh, which I collected during my stay at Yale University. And what you can see from this graph, from this picture, is that how you manage the climate in the museum, it impacts significantly on the energy consumption. You can see here that if you are in the historic house museum, you can use tens up to hundreds times less energy than in the modern museums if you are in, if you are in controlling the environment in an irresponsible way. And it occurs that institutions which are using a lot of uh, energy, they are very rich institutions, as Yale, which is the second uh, uh, richest university in the world, and the Harvard one. So this is very important to manage, to protect, to preserve the collection in a responsible, responsible way. And I can give you a, a lot of, of uh, examples, but I think that this image shows the best the situation explained. It is the image of the banner which was hung by the students at the gate to the Academy of Fine Arts, which says, on the dead planet there is no art. And I think that this starts to be more and more important, and the young generation is particularly sensitive about, 
about that. The another development, another new trend is applying the business model to evaluate the preservation uh, effectiveness of the preservation act, uh, actions. And this is the, these are data are were, were published by Canadian Conservation Institute, which shows on the uh, y-axis the cost-benefit ratio uh, for uh, application of different preservation measures in four type of the institution in Canada. Two of them, they are historic house museums. There is uh, archive and art gallery, city art gallery. And what you can see from, from, from this, and on the x-axis, you have the uh, magnitude of risk to the, to the collection. So when you have 1% and this magnitude of risk is, is expressed in the fraction of the collection which is lost per year. So when you have 1%, it, it means that you have extreme ris risk. So this is only the case when you have the, the institution uh, in the area which could be flooded or where you have extreme risk of, risk of fire. But what you can find here that this cost effectiveness, which is expressed in monetary values, which only politicians understand. They understand only when you express why something is important when you show the symbol of dollars. And it shows the, the amount of uh, uh, monetary value saved versus the cost of the, of the given preventive conservation action. And what you can see here, that there is a trend. The most effective is to treat the largest risks independently on the type of the institution. So when your institution focuses on something small risk, it means that it's also not cost effective. And these business models, they are of course not decisive what we should do, but they are definitely supporting rational decisions. And now I'm going to the, because what we are trying to do when we are thinking about the preservation, we are preserving the value and the very difficult point in this evaluation, making a decision is to assess what the loss of the value is due to some uh, deterioration agents. And here you can see the miniature from the uh, National Museum in Krakow. This is this miniature is within the snuffed, uh, snuffed box and it's made of the uh, colors, it's made of the pigments which are photosensitive. So the color is fading over the time. And we made some predictions at the National Museum in Krakow and you see the color change, predicted color change. And how much the value we lose? Is it 1%, is it 5%, is it 20%? And there is no other way now, only by self-reporting of the conservators or, or the public, but there is no objective ways to measure it. But fortunately, museums start to employ the neuroscientists, and here you can see the, the images from the uh, Peabody Essex Museum in Massachusetts, we, who employed the first neuroscientists who measures the reactions, objective reactions of the people. And this, of course, is very important for practical use because the museum wants to optimize the experience of the, of the users, of the visitors. But there is even more fundamental question. Why we think that certain object is valuable? Why it's a masterpiece? Why the certain painter or artist is a genius? We don't have question for that except uh, the opinion of the curators, of the art historian and so on. We need some other objective ways. And I would like to draw your attention to the image on the right because it shows the uh, eye tracking analysis. So you have the glasses which uh, track the movement of your pupil uh, and you, you can analyze what our visitors looking at. This is absolutely fundamental. And there, were f there is a few, very, very few, uh, very recent publi um, uh, scientific publications about that. Here is the, the publication by Lotte, Tino, and Krupinski, who published the work uh, how conservation influenced the fixation of the, influenced the fixation of the human, human uh, size, human vision for the objects before and after conservation. Here you can see uh, on the image, this the patterns of the fixation. You might say there is no much difference, but there is some if you look closer. 
and this is particularly visible here in this lower lower image, but the the places of the eye fixation doesn't change so much. What changes definitely is the time of the first eye fixation and the total time of the uh, of the eye fixation. So it means that people after conservation they spend more time in front of the picture. This is the scientific research fact. And just very, very basic information how the representation of the objects is created in our brain. Of course, in our eyes, we have the, the cones which are photosensitive, and they re record the blue, green, and red color, but the information which is transfer transferred to, the, to our brain, to ganglion cells, goes in the three channels. The first channel is luminous channel, so we see it something is bright and something is dark. The second channel is green and red, and finally, we have blue and yellow. So it's just not just very simple colors goes to our brain. It goes, the, we have like three cables and this is the information which is trans transferred to our, to our brain. And look how it impacts or how can it can explain the impact when we are looking at the works of art. And of course, I would like to do that with the Claude Monet painting, which is the uh, uh, sun, uh, impression sunrise, which was in Marmotown Museum, and this uh, slide I obtained from the professor uh, Piotr Francis, who unfortunately passed last year. And when we look at this painting, and you look at the eye fixation, so what you see first, that people are looking mainly at the sun, then at the boat, then at the reflexes of the sun in the Seine River, and finally on the signature. We can calculate the time of total fixation and you see that the, there is dominating, we, people are looking mainly at the sun, at the sun in, this, in this painting. And let's go and look what happens in the first channel, which is luminous channels. We are looking only on the, on the brightness. And you see what you cannot see. You cannot see sun, neither reflections. When we look, and here is the, the sorry, the, here is the, the image, the contrast image, because human eye is particularly uh, sensitive to the contrast. You, again, you don't see the, the, the sun and reflections. When you look at the red-green channel, you definitely see the sun and the reflections. This is the representation in the gray scale. And this is the, the contrast image. And yellow and blue. The same, you definitely see many, many features in these paintings. You can see grayscale. You see the contrast. And let's compare all of them. So Monet, he was a genius because he could adopt the red color he could choose select the red color in such a way that it has the same brightness as a blue color next to it. And it is why when you're looking at this painting for the long time, you see that sun is appearing and disappearing because your brain is cheated. It receives two contrasting, conflicting information. One channel tells you there is no brain and luminous channels because of the evolution is the most important because tell, it tells you, it told us in the past, escape because there is a lion in the grass and we are, this is the most important, the colors are less important, but we receive uh, conflicting information and he was so long looking at the tip of his brush that he could, he could do that. And similar story is with uh, Henri Matisse and uh, he painted the, the, the portrait of his wife and uh, Amélie no Noëlle Parayer, and let's say uh, it was not the happiest couple in the world. This, we couldn't call it the, the, the romantic love. She, he was completely dependent on, on her money and she could use money to control him and to imprison him. So he painted uh, her portrait, the woman in a hat, and you see, nice painting. When you analyze that, 
in three channels which goes to our brain. The luminous channels is fine. The red and green, it's again, it's quite fine. Again, the, the, the grayscale representation. And let's go into blue, yellow, blue. And you see that something starts to happen. She is a monster. She is a monster. So when you are looking at this painting, when you are looking at this painting for a long time, not just as if you don't spend time, but you don't know what's going on. You have this emotion, even unconsciously. You, you receive that. And my last slide is about the heritage computing. This is absolutely very fast de developing the, the, the direction of the research because, of course, of the tech giants from the Silicon Valley. And, and there is a, a wonderful project, I think, that uh, free collection in the New York is one of the leading institution in, their, in the world. Larry Reich's museum is the second. But in the free collection, they, they had a project with the Stanford University, with the mathematicians from the Stanford University, and they applied the learning machine technologies to teach the computer to catalog the objects. So the computers, computers just observe the curator's cataloging, and they they learned that and they started to catalog and they achieved 95% of the right uh, cataloging uh, positions and curators now, they only correct the computer and they speed up the process of cataloging by four times. And of course it's much more, much more cheaper. And can I ask now for the, for the another uh, graph we shows or another website, this is from the Google website I will, I, will, I will do that, thank you. Uh, from the Google the website, on the Google, they have a huge number, they have billions of images, and they learn the machine computers how to find the similarities between the images. And uh, there is more than 2,000 uh, similarity algorithms, which even we don't realize that they exist, but they exist, and they apply them to evaluate the the collections uh, composed of hundreds, thousands of, of objects. And now I would like just to, I don't know if, uh, and they, sorry, I can't, I don't see my mouse, I'm sorry. So maybe you can scroll down and show, for example, and sele please select one, one image and please click one image. Maybe another one because we don't see the other objects so the algorithms, they find the similarities between different types of the, of the objects, and this is absolutely new information. Sometimes we don't realize that the objects of the Indian or he, Hindu or Indian uh, art is similar to other art, artwork from the other, other cultures. So this is absolutely fascinated uh, field of the research. And in this moment, I would like to stop my presentation, finish my presentation, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lukash. I think it was so, so much new to all of us. Uh, we'll have a discussion after the panel, and if you want to ask questions right now, you can do it just enough to, for people who are <laughs> online with us, it's just enough to uh, log into your Google account. But however, after uh, the panel, we'll have also a possibility to connect with everyone online, because it will be possible, we'll give a link to a Zoom link, and you'll be, it will be possible to comment uh, in person. So, so I, I'm just <laughs> uh, saying what will happen afterwards. And now I would like to invite our second speaker, uh, Jos van Burden. I hope I'm reading well. <laughs> uh, he's a senior researcher of colonial cultural collections and restitution, affiliated with the Free University in Amsterdam. His pioneering study, Treasures in Truster Hands Negotiating the Future of Colonial Cultural Objects, published in Leiden 2017, was nominated for the Beckham Dissertation Prize in the Netherlands and it has put restitution of colonial collections on the agenda in the Netherlands. And what is also important is a very comprehensive book and for anyone who wants to start his or her uh, adventure, I would really recommend it. 
Uh, he also wrote, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll translate it, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a book in Dutch, which is forthcoming. Uh, Uncomfortable Heritage, Colonial Collections and Restitutions in the Netherlands in Belgium, and will publish this year. Um, and uh, relocating Derf's Museum Nusantra collection lessons and questions. Uh, in Amsterdam, published in Amsterdam 2012. Uh, and uh, for his merits in the cultural heritage field, he was appointed officer in the order of the Orange Nassau. So, Jos, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me and offering an opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you and thoughts which are completely different from the previous speaker but I've been listening with fascination to what you said but you know I want to start I'll, I'll be talking about colonial collections about restitution about new technologies and I want to start with some good news from Belgium Belgium. Last Friday, the federal government announced a very remarkable decision. It said that the museum, the big Africa museum with ethnological collections from Congo in Africa, they have identified over 880 objects which obviously were war booty. They were stolen or taken in full against the will of the local population. And you know what they did? They said, these objects, these 880 objects, they are from now on, they are property of Congo, of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we are the custodians, as long as Congo wants us to be that. So they said, you know, they gave them back to Congo, but still Congo says, well, we're not yet ready to receive them, and for the time being, you keep them. Now, this is an incredible change, and I'm also telling it to create some sort of a, not a contradiction, but a, a, quite a big difference if you, if you discuss colonial collections in Poland. You know, we haven't heard about it. It's new, it's a new subject. But in, in Europe, and also in North America, and Canada, and the US, you know, you know, we are really, the, the, the museums are really becoming aware of the need to decolonize their museums. Now, decolonization, it's a very tricky, it's a bit a difficult concept. You know, it's about, it's about recognizing mistakes. It's doing away with exploitation, with racism, with discrimination, and also with a misplaced sense of superiority. Now, what I will discuss is much more it's the massive flow during five centuries of uh, colonial expansion of cultural and historical objects, human remains and archives from colonial possessions to West European countries and the impact of new technologies on restitution issues. So I'll be touching like you, Lucas, new technologies, but in a very different way. And I'll have two uh, propositions to make, yes. The, you know, first I will talk about Poland should participate actively in the ongoing debate about the restitution of colonial collections acquired under dubious circumstances. And I will explain why I do that. And the second is, is about technologies. New technologies are more relevant for archives from colonial contexts than for objects or human remains. I start with the first one, but before I do that, you know, I want to make some sort of a subdivision of colonial collections. And I've made two subdivisions. They are relevant for, for what I'm saying this afternoon. You know, the first one is based on their nature. And I distinguish between objects, and they're often religious, cultural, or historical important. There are human remains, skulls, body parts, etc., And there are archives. And I mean both archives of the colonial administration but also uh, archives captured from the, uh, the colonized people. And I have a second subdivision, it's also relevant, and that's on the way, based, the way they have been acquired. Now, there have been many voluntary exchanges. You know, what happened in practice was that it often happened that a European ship was arriving, 
the local artisans were running with their objects to the coastal areas and they were trying to sell them. Sometimes it happened that Europe, European sailors or scientists, they ordered objects to be made for them. That was a win-win situation. Nothing that's not problematic at all. The other one is the involuntary losses. That is war booty. That is smuggling, theft. That was confiscation by missionaries. Destruction of objects. And in the, between those two, there is a large, large gray area because of the limited documentation of which we do not know how they have been acquired in the past. So keep that in mind, it will come back. Now, you know, coming to Poland, I thought I have to think about, you know, thinking about colonialism in the Netherlands is not so difficult because the Netherlands was just a huge colonial power and we were never colonized. Well, you can say we were colonized by Spain, but it's long, long, long ago. And Poland is much more, is much more subtle, it's much more complicated. My thing is, my, my, what I feel is that it, Poland is balancing between being colonized and being colonizer. And we see both of them. Poland never acquired their own colonies, that's obvious, but it had colonial aspirations. And it's a bit compatible with some Scandinavian countries, especially Finland and Norway, who are in a bit in a similar situation. But if you look at Denmark and Sweden, who only initially had colonies, but they lost them to the Dutch, to the British and so on. Um, and th what you see in Scandinavia say, you know, they say colonialism and decolonization is something from, from Europe for the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, the UK, the, the Great Britain, France, Spain and, and, and Portugal, but not for us. That is changing. You see in the literature, but also in the practice of museums in, in Sweden and Denmark and, and Norway, that are really realizing that they do have a colonial past, be it very different from, um, from, from other countries in Europe. So, um, and they are turning the tide, as I say. Now, I've been looking for this Poland, and I call it distance colonialism because it was at far distance. And I found several things. One in which the Poland is um, being on, on the side of the colonized, maybe you all know it, but it's fascinating. Around 1800, Napoleon, he was facing um, a revolt by enslaved people on Haiti. And he engaged over 5,000 Polish soldiers to beat down that uh, revolt. And these soldiers, they were told, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting so story, these soldiers, they were told that they were sent to Haiti to beat down a revolt of prisoners. They came to Haiti, and in their first encounters, they saw these are not prisoners, these are, ju these are just enslaved people. And you know what they did? They changed sides. They took the sides of the insurgents. And I thought, you understand? They took the side of the slaves and they did it, which was good. So that was then was Poland on the side, on the uh, balancing on one side of the, um, of the colonized. But there are also that it is look, taking the sides of the, of the colonizers. And then, you know, Poland never got its own colonies. It tried Liberia, ca uh, Cameroon. You know, it had missionaries in, in China, in Africa. Many people were employed from Poland also in the, in the colonies by, by er, other European powers. There were explorers. I don't dare to pronounce his name, actually. Stefan Sotz Rogoczynski. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, he, did, he did important work in, in Cameroon. And the interesting thing was that after the Versailles Peace in 1919, Poland and, and then Germany lost all its colonies. And Poland then tried to get a number of these German colonies, especially Cameroon, but they failed, you know, and it went to, I think it went to Britain and, and France. But there is one very, very interesting thing with I feel, and that's this maritime and colonial league, the Liga Moscae Coloniana. And it was an interwar between the two world wars that existed there. It had, at a certain moment, it had millions of sympathizers. It had a million members. 
And the main motive behind this league was to help Polish people to emigrate to other areas. Poland was poor. Many people from the rural sites, they came to the cities. In the cities, there was no work, so emigrate. And in that sense, the, the colonial aspirations of Poland, they differed from colonial aspirations of other European powers. They were after um, raw materials, spices, coffee, you know, the, in, in, uh, in um, rubber, etc. So they were aspiring to help emigrants, and they went to many, many places. They were to Angola, you know, Brazil, um, Haiti, <coughs> Haiti uh, other places in Africa. I'm, I'm just confused. <laughs> um, so I have to look at my paper. Okay. Good. Sorry. Um, and, they were, and many people they established in, in colonies, for instance, there the, on, the, on the third side, it's, um, it's, it's in Brazil, I think, and on the right side you see this the demonstrations of this maritime and colonial league in, in one of the Polish cities. This traveling to other places and explorers having in other places in Africa also meant that um, colonial objects began to come to Poland from missionaries, etc. And um, I've been looking for it, but it's quite difficult. It's, it's hard to find it because there is literature about it, but it's almost all in Poland, in Polish, in the Polish language. So my first appeal to you is please, please start to translate it into English. Because, you know, it's part of an international thing. We need it in English. Uh, or ask people to summarize it, you know? Because I know that, like there have been missionaries in China. I know that they took objects to here, but we don't know where they are, etc. So that's one thing. And the same for traders and the same for, for scientists and so. But I was looking for w where do we find uh, colonial collections. Now, I will deal with you two, two examples. And one is the, the National Museum in Chechin. You know, they have different objects. I found this on their website. On the left side, it's, um, it's a nil statue, a power image from, from the Democratic Republic of Congo. In the middle, it's an ancient manuscript, very ancient, 19th century, from North Africa or the Middle East. And on the right side, do, do you recognize on the right side what it is? Yes, I see several of one nodding you. It's a Benin object. You know, a Benin object captured in 1897 by British military from the kingdom of Benin in Nigeria. And I'll, I'll come back to that later, but you can say that in the discussion between most European countries and Africa on restitution, the Benin objects are number one. That's, in, that's interesting. So this is already an example that Poland has uh, colonial collections. And there's another thing, th another example is in Lodz. And I think if I understand the history of Poland well, it's almost typical characteristic for your, for your history. You know, the, the archeological and ethnographic museum in Lodz, they had about 1,460 objects mostly from Africa and South America, you know, utensils, masks, feather headdresses, etc. And they were recently collected by 12 collectors, so that's known, and they were linked to this maritime and colonial league about which I spoke earlier. But what happened in 39, when Hitler Germany invaded Poland, you know, they confiscated many, many museum collections, and this collection also, it went to Leipzig. And thank you, Eva, for, for pointing me to it, because it's really new information for me as well, and I like to share it. They brought it to Leipzig, and from Leipzig, part of it remained in Leipzig, and other parts went to Cologne, Göttingen, and Hamburg. Now, typical for the um, Second World War was that the parts that went to Cologne and Hamburg were destructed, so we lost a lot of it, and there was already in 1967 a restitution from Leipzig, but that was also in the, in the framework of Eastern Europe. And there was another uh, restitution in 2016 by the University of Göttingen. So you see that there was a colonial collection, it became a Nazi confiscated art, and it became again a colonial collection. 
it's, it's, it's fascinating and thrilling story, but also very painful. And of course, in the meantime, lots of documentation were lost. Then I go back to my initial things, you know, objects acquired in a win-win situation, ob looted objects and the gray area. So what has been left over belongs to the gray area. We don't know to how, how it was acquired in the past. So, you know, these are two examples to, to support my first proposition that Poland should not forget the whole restitution debate in Europe, you know, without denying the big differences between um, the Polish involvement and the involvement of, of countries such as the Netherlands, Belgium, France, uh, Germany, and, and the UK. I will go to my, the second part. Yes. And that's the, the, the second proposition that is new technologies are more relevant for archives from colonial contexts than for objects or human remains. And I will first look, look at it for communication and provenance research, and then for digital representation and repatriation. It's a tremendous progress, the digitization. I was talking the other day to, um, to the head of archive of Namibia, and she said when we began with it, we had, we had the only, we had these fishes, these small things, you know, and they get broken, they get dirty, you know, we, we, you lose them, many, many things, and now it's all, we are, we are slowly made digitizing the whole thing. And in, it happened more often that, you know, this helped very much. Now, I want to go to two examples. The first is the invisible ventories, and that's questioning, it says, Kenyan collection in Western museums. The interesting thing is that um, the National Museum of Kenya was always, always interested in getting back objects, but they didn't know how to do it. And they started to cooperate with museums in West Germany, in, especially in Cologne. And they started this website, and together they, they looked over the whole world for foreign objects in foreign museums and heritage institutions, and they found over 32,000. Now, this is a tremendous achievement, and it does not mean that they will be claiming 32,000 objects, but at least it helps to be as a start, you know, on which to base a policy. And I remember, it's, it, it's a very moving story, the um, Sri Lanka, totally different country, Sri Lanka in 1975, the director of the National Museum traveled all over the world. He had to travel. Now they did it digitally. And he visited um, 120 institutions in 30 countries. And he made such a big book, thick book, with 15,000 objects from Sri Lanka in foreign, in foreign museums and heritage institutions. And he came back. And then in 1980, they had selected a few hundred objects out of this big book and submitted it to the UNESCO and to the different countries, also to the Netherlands and Belgium, asking, well, you know, these few hundreds we would like to have back. And at that time, all these countries said the door was closed. They didn't do it. It was very frustrating because they had been working very hard. Now it's more promising because, the, you know, it's, it's well, 15,000, 32,000, it's double, but there's much more realistic uh, a chance that, that it will help. The, another option is digital Benin. I was talking about the, the Benin object in, in the National Museum of Chechen. Now, digital Benin is a um, um, cooperation between Benin, the, the kingdom of Benin in Nigeria and several um, museums in Europe, especially in Hamburg. And what they do is they make, they make an inventory of all the Benin objects. You know, the, the estimates are that in 1897, between 2,400 and 4,000 of these Benin objects, they disappeared. And because Britain, you know, they were auctioning a lot of them and they were selling a lot of them, so they have been dispersed all over the world, especially all over Europe and North America. They are making an inventory also to prepare a return to Benin City. And um, in Benin, in the kingdom of Benin, they're building a new museum, which is up to international standards, in order to be able to, to really welcome these objects and to, 
preserve them in a responsible manner. So you see slowly that you know th this is a fantastic opportunity for them to help it improve. Now the other thing is which I discovered, it was announced a few weeks ago that in the, um, our national archive in The Hague has about 12 kilometers of archives of the Dutch East India Company. You cannot believe it because Europeans are mad because they're writing down everything and they want to keep everything. They want to preserve and only few countries do that. China has been doing that since the ninth century or something. And, yeah. But and now what they do, but you almost cannot read them. Even for me, it's difficult as a Dutch person, it's difficult to read it. Now they are, um, th they make these documents more accessible just by presenting them in a printed version. So then you can also use your search machine and you can use them and even you can translate them into other things. You know, that's, that's very promising. And, and also for private groups, you know, I'm myself, I'm involved in, in the Restitution Matters project, exchanging messages about colonial collections and restitution. And it's a, it's a fantastic means because we reach about 1,100 scholars, heritage scholars, in the global south and the global north, exchanging worldwide on, on you know, what restitution, like the Belgian message, everybody knows it now. So for communication and provenance research, big, big progress. Now, if we go to the, you know, I was making this distinction between objects, human remains, and archives, and we look to digital representation and repre repatriation. I want to start with human remains and funerary objects, because that's the least possible. That, that will be the most difficult, because the, uh, you know, to um, of course we in the, um, in Europe we have hundreds of thousands of bones, skulls, body parts from colonial places. And um, it's very painful because I know in Germany they have, I think, something like 7,000 skulls from colonial areas, but they do not know where they came from. And you cannot offer us, Namibia is saying we want our skulls back. Tanzania is saying, former German colony, we want our skulls back. But you can, if you don't know to which country it belongs, you cannot give it back. In the, in the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, they have many, many ob uh, bones and, and human remains from, from New Guinea. Now, New Guinea is, is many, many times bigger than the Netherlands. Many, many peoples are living there. But the, the sign says only, skull from New Guinea. I know in the, in the museum in Brussels, it's, they have skulls, and it says, skull from Central Africa. Central Africa is bigger than the whole of Europe. And so where, to whom do you give it back? But it's also that, um, you know, this is an, this image on the right, it's a return of a tattooed Maori head. And it, it's, the tattooed Maori head, it's a fascinating story because in 2003, the government of New Zealand, the National Museum in Wellington, plus the Maori communities in New Zealand, they said, we want to have our skulls back. And they started the repatriation program with a very clear division of labor. The government is financing, the National Museum is facilitating, but the Maori communities, they're first and foremost, they are receiving the heads and they get them back. But why am I saying this? On the picture you see boxes, only boxes, you don't see a head. I don't have pictures of a Maori head. Well, I could get it from the internet, but I don't do it out of respect because I know the Maoris, they are really against that we show, their, that we show their, the remains of their people. So that, you know, and it's very clear. And at the same time, so if I'm frank, you know, if we talk about mummies, for instance, I know that in South America and in Egypt, they're less strong and outspoken about showing mummies. Like this picture is from a museum in South America and they just show the mummies and they still do that. But in general, I think for human remains and funerary objects, the new technologies have little to offer, if I'm frank, except for the communication and the provenance research. Now, if you go to objects, 
you know, the, I think the main thing, I think one of the main things behind decolonization is the, is the restoration of equality, or you could say the diminishing of the inequality. And that means that give a big voice to the community of origin, the state of origin or whoever it is. And I know that the, um, the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History and the Tlingit native community, they did that. And it's really fascinating because um, they gave back that big, the killer whale clan crest, it's in the middle on the right. Uh, yes, that was the original. But then the museum said, is it allowed that we make a copy of it? Now we can make with 3D presentation, we can make perfect copies. And they allowed it. In other instances, they will not allow it, and then it does not happen. But in this case, they allowed it, and it was also it was inaugurated officially. So there are really options to do that, but it's exceptional. In general account, I remember there is a big has been a big discussion between the Netherlands and Indonesia about the number of big Hindu statues from the, the island of Java. And Indonesia has always said, the original should be with us, and we will offer you perfect copies. Because in Asia, making a copy is a master, then you're a really master if you're good at it. You know, and they're really willing to do it, but they say the original should be us. Now, another example of digital representation is, is the Africa Search project of the Africa Museum in Belgium. It's interesting because they have, together with communities in Congo, they have selected a number of objects. They're, together with the local population, they are investigating the history, the provenance of these objects, and the main purpose of it is the promotion of peace and reconciliation. Because, as many of you might know, Eastern Congo is a, is a war area, is a conflict area, very serious. And they are doing it. So they start to work with it digitally, have agreed also with the communities to do so. But in the end, in 10 years or so, it might result in the physical restitution of the objects. So these are, these are possibilities. But looking at digital, at new technologies for archives, it's the best. You know, archives, we often forget that, but archives are power. They're very important. And who controls the archives and the making of archives controls the history and the image we have of the past. And I remember that in the, in the 1970s, Belgium and the Democratic Republic and Congo were negotiating about archives, and Belgium refused to return them. And why? Because the Belgian companies, they were against it. You know, there was this main company, the Union Minière, the Haute Katanga, so that, that was a mining company. They were very powerful, and they didn't want to let the information go because they knew where in the soil were the minerals, where could they be found, and they did not want to share that with the new government. Now, that's, that's recolonization, you almost could say. And um, the same between the Netherlands and Indonesia, it was also very sensitive. Because sometimes these uh, colonial archives, they contain information which can be very incriminating for, for, the, for the colonizer. And in fact, you might not know that, but between 1945 and 1949, Indonesia was fighting a war of independence and the, the violence was just, and the human rights violation, it was, it was really horrible. So, but now it is changing slowly and then the new technology is really um, offering um, very good possibilities and especially at, uh, in Europe, especially Belgium and Rwanda, they're making a lot of progress because Belgium, they have agreed, Rwanda says we do not want the originals here. In other words, it, I mean, it saves them a lot of money because you have, to be you have to be careful with them. It's all paperwork and let Belgium do that. But we need the information and the information, especially about geological, you know, about sources, mineral resources, agricultural potential. We want to have that because we need it for the development of the country. And there is a fantastic opportunities for, for new technologies. Um, I will wrap up, but I, I want to make one remark and I have to look for that. I don't have to summarize it, but you know what I was mentioning 
um, the word equality. And I think, first of all, I think Poland really should engage, change into English, and engage in the debate about restitution. Please join us, we need it. And we will respect all the differences. And the biggest clue will be equality and trust, the biggest clue between colonizers and colonized. Because colonialism has violated a lot of trust. It has violated human rights and it has created unequal structures and it is really very problematic. And I think as former colonizers, it is our responsibility to set the first steps towards the former colonies and to convince them that we really are working for it, that they really want to, to work on more equal terms like Belgium has started to do now. And many of them, I know many museum directors, you know, they just don't believe, they don't believe us. They say, first we have to see back and then we will believe you. So, um, I think the challenge is to do this, yeah, to do this in an atmosphere of reducing inequality and diminishing distrust. I remember an, uh, a curator from Argentina saying, please, please, to Western Museum, please, please, stop to mistrust us, to distrust us. You know, we're getting so sick of it. Stop to underestimate us. Just value our work. We do it different. We do not do it in the same way as you do, but value it. Um, okay, that's enough. I think I've said enough. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jos, for both this comprehensive uh, and rare explanation of, of the like, role in, of technology in this uh, restitution and the colonizing process, and also for one of the first, <laughs> really, <laughs> uh, discussions about the colonial heritage in Polish collections, and I think we'll go back to this <laughs> in the discussion. And now I would like to invite our last speaker, our last but not least, <laughs> Armando Perla, who is an independent uh, curator and consultant. He currently acts as an international advisor on museums, human rights, and social inclusion for the city of Medellin. He was a founding team member of the Canadian Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg and the Swedish Museum of Migration and Democracy in Malmo. Armando is also a board member of ICOM's International Committee on Ethical Dilemmas. <laughs> He's pursuing his doctorate in art history and museology at the University of Montreal. So welcome, Armando. Thank you. Um, and um, I want to start by thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it really is a privilege to be here and uh, to see this really uh, wonderful museum. I also want to thank you, Eva, as well, and uh, the organizers from DigiConflict for um, having me here. Uh, today, uh, well, I also want to thank for you know to the two previous speakers for two wonderful presentations, and Jos for um, kind of um, creating a really nice segue for what I'm going to talk about because I'm also going to talk about um, decolonization, but from a different angle. But it will be some intersections in there that uh, you will also notice because I will talk a little bit about uh, as well restitution and repatriation. But um, the way that I'm going to, uh, or the way that I have framed the presentation, the structure that I will talk about um, human rights museology first, instead of like a critique of um, one of the definitions, but they get to um, a little bit of how um, I believe uh, it's a better way to understand human rights museology. And then I'm going to uh, provide some um, practical examples of where human rights museology has been used at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, but then also at the uh, Swedish Museum of Movement. And that's kind of going to be um, the structure. So I'll start a little bit uh, more theoretical, like I said. And um, in the early 2010s, um, Canadian scholars Jennifer Carter and uh, Jennifer Orange developed this uh, definition of human rights museology, the one that I'm going to um, criticize a little bit. But um, they argue that uh, human rights museology um, was sort of like a product of this uh, turn um, of uh, our society towards more of um, human rights. And that came from uh, many different um, sort of events you know, around the world, which you know we are very familiar with. But it also was related to uh, the turn of uh, the priority of museums and shifting from sort of the focus on uh, objects and artifacts towards more of uh, society and humans. And I will talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, 
So the um, say the human rights museology has uh, sprung from uh, sort of this uh, sort of um, development of many human rights museums around the world that started in the 1980s. So the first one that they name as uh, Liberty Osaka in uh, Japan. Um, and of course, there is many more that are uh, not listed there, but these are also the ones that have human rights in their name, in the name of the museum. There are many other ones that don't have uh, the name human rights in their, in, uh, listed as their name, like for example, this one. And then we have been listening uh, all this morning about all these human rights stories, right, and the way that um, it is presented. So, um, and then again, um, I've also added a couple of ones that uh, still, you know, they, they were just uh, created um, in 2019, which is the Museum of uh, Freedom and Human Rights in Panama, and there is also the Museum of the Holocaust and Human Rights in Dallas, uh, Texas, that was also created uh, in 2019, or reopened. Um, so both um, Carter and uh, Orange also tell us that uh, the International Coalition of the Sites of Conscience, it's sort of like, um, it lays the great, you know, the, the groundwork for um, this idea of human rights museology to be developed. Um, and uh, if you look at their um, website, you can see that they refer themselves to as a place that provides a safe space to remember and preserve and, uh, even the most traumatic uh, memories. They also enable the visitors to make connections between the past and uh, related contemporary human rights issues. Uh, so that sort of laid uh, the groundwork, like I said, for what uh, these two academics sort of refer to uh, the key player in developing this theory of human rights, which is the International Federa or the Federation of International Human Rights Museums. Um, in the Federation, um, in their website, they uh, talk about um, the Federation being about sharing, working together, learning from each other, and encouraging each other, um, which is also uh, about being active, looking at the ways our museums can challenge contemporary racism, discrimination, and other human rights abuses. And here I want to point out that the focus of uh, the Federation is on museums, so it's in institutions, which I find, and, and we're gonna see this as well reflected in the human rights definition of Carter and Orange, because to me this is kind of like a contradiction because we're talking about human rights uh, museology, right? And we're not centering humans, we're centering institutions. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about that in, in a second. So um, it's interesting as well that in uh, 2018, a branch in Latin America of the Federation was opened. Uh, and again, if you look at uh, the way that it's described, it's still very much focused on Latin American museums. It's not really on humans, right? And it talks about you know, uh, contribute to the public's awareness, interest in understanding and respect for those rights, declare inalienable for all human beings. It's also not very controversial. Uh, it's not really challenging that much, right? Even though uh, the Federation says that they are about challenging the way that museums do thing, things, um, it doesn't really look like they are challenging anything. Um, and then in uh, the year later, in 2019, the Federation also opened a branch in the Asian Pacific region, which for the first time, then they refer to uh, museum professionals and human rights workers. So this is the first time that they start talking about humans and centering humans. And so I just you know, pointed it out because I think it's, it's, it's interesting to, uh, to look at. Uh, and so this is the definition that was developed by uh, Cardin Orange. And if you look at it, uh, again, it's very much uh, museum center. And so it tells us that uh, human rights museology is an evolving body of theory and professional practices. So theory is first, and that's also important to notice, uh, underlying the global phenomenon of museums dedicated to the subject of social injustices, one that is fundamentally changing the form and nature of museum work. Human rights museology acknowledges the potential for museums to engage in campaigns against human rights violations at the local, national, and international level. This work means that museums are required to take a public stand on political issues which may seek to aid museums in conflict with their funders. So this is interesting because like I said, um, it really centers museums. It doesn't talk about people, it doesn't talk about humans, and it also talks about um, human rights campaigns. And again, it's sort of this idea of um, human rights museums or museums, institutions doing the work outside of institutions. So we're gonna go save the world, but it doesn't really look at the museum inside, internally, and how the museum function. And that is also another aspect of colonialism, right? Colon colonization was also founded on this idea of going to save the world. We're going to go and Christianize people and all that. So again, it's a very colonial um, sort of definition. Um, and so, 
the um, way that I have been trying to work from also human rights to sort of um, create my own definition of human rights missiology is based on my own practice, which is, you know, it's the opposite of the other one. So the other one is theory and then practice, and so mine is practice and then a theory. So because I was trained as a human rights lawyer, because I, before working in the museum sector, I work as a human rights um, activist in many different parts of the world, I became familiar with the human rights-based approach. And the human rights-based approach it's a conceptual framework that, you know, uh, for the process of human development that is normatively based on international human rights standards and operationally directed to promote and protect human rights. It seeks to analyze inequalities which lie at the heart of development problems and redress discriminatory practices and unjust distributions of power, which again are consequences of colonization and colonialism, right? Uh, that impede development progress and often results in groups of people being left behind. So there's also connections with solidarity in here, right? Because we don't want to leave people uh, or groups of people behind. Um, so the human rights based approach as well uh, promotes empowering people, especially the most marginalized. And so here is also that connection with decolonization because I'm looking at decolonization not only in the context of repatriation, but also in the context of, um, be, or, of um, having people being able to tell their own stories and their own terms. So. Like I said, uh, the human rights-based approach empowers people, especially the most marginalized, to participate in all processes and phases of a project. This is important when we're talking about museums, right? And to hold accountable those who have a duty to act. Under this framework, human rights are not considered just one element or dimension in the mainstream processes. They constitute the foundational framework and the basis for the entire process of socio-political organization and development. So human rights is not just content that we're going to put on exhibitions, but also human rights is a methodology that we're going to use inside of the museum and how we're going to prioritize those who have been uh, historically excluded from taking part in these different processes and creating exhibitions, creating programming, all different uh, kinds of um, processes that we develop in a museum. Um, so I'm now talking about uh, decolonization because there is a link between the human rights based approach and decolonization that we've also uh, talked about. And so uh, Powai Cairns, who is an indigenous uh, museum professional from uh, New Zealand, she works at Te Papa, uh, the National Museum of New Zealand, tells us that her version of decolonization is putting the people at center and not the interest of the colonial machine. So not the interest of the museum or the institution. So this is another aspect of the decolonization that we saw earlier in the previous presentation, right? We talked about its focus uh, very much in the repatriation. But the decolonization, I'm interested in both, but the one that I am most interested in is the one that really centers people and the one that really brings people to be able to take uh, leadership in those decisions that are being made that directly affect their lives. Um, so this is a definition that I've developed um, like I said, from the practice of um, working in museums. And so I see human rights museology as a museology from below, so from the subaltern, from those marginal marginalized voices who have been left behind. A set of museum practices and corresponding body of theory that aim to further human rights through the prioritization and participation of historically excluded people in all museum processes that directly affect them. Human rights museology goes beyond using codified articulations of human rights and includes anti-oppression, anti-racism, decolonization, and indigenization as the tenets of museum work. Um, so how then uh, we related to the repatriation that we were talking about in the previous uh, presentation. And uh, from um, the UN expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples comes a report that was released last year in October. And so that report is the report on the rep repatriation of ceremonial objects, human remains, and intangible heritage of indigenous peoples under the declaration of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP. And so it's interesting because here we talk about yeah, human remains, intangible, her intangible heritage, and ceremonial objects. But when we talk, um, as indigenous peoples and when indigenous peoples talk about um, their repatriation, we talk about um, ancestors, uh, belongings, and treasures. So it's not even the same terminology, right? So uh, in the report, uh, there is a direct link between uh, the human rights-based approach and the decolonization of museums. Uh, for example, it tells us that advancing a human rights-based approach in museum practice can play an essential role in decolonizing museums. So we're going to see a little bit more of what I mean by uh, that decolonization of, uh, or what decolonization means in this context. So in the uh, report as well, 
MBRIP or the expert mechanism tells us that moving towards a human rights-based approach may therefore require a dramatic shift. In many instances, this transition begins with museums exploring cooperation with indigenous peoples as constituents, employees, and stakeholders. As museums increasingly embrace indigenous peoples' cultural rights, Along with repatriation, they are also able to develop more extensive relationships, better information about collections, and collaborative programming consistent with museums' current goals to be inclusive, diverse, and relevant to today's societies. So, and here you can see again sort of that idea of what a human rights museology that centers humans can look like from the words of the expert mechanism of indigenous rights. But how can we translate that into actual uh, and practical examples, right? So for me, oral history is the way to do that. And this is one of many ways. Repatriation, like we talked before, is also another way. But, uh, or repatriation processes which are led by indigenous peoples, which are led by people, um, are to me one way of doing it. But like I said, oral history as well is another way of doing it. And here you can see as well one clear example of how um, oral history relates to you know, the human rights-based approach, but also that concept of human rights museology that we've been talking about. So uh, Paul Thompson, for example, states that a, um, oral history is a history built around people. It thrusts uh, life into history itself and widens its scope. It allows hearers not from not just from the leaders, but also from the unknown majority of the people. So again, like the subaltern, like those voices that we haven't heard before. It encourages teachers and students to become fellow workers. It brings history into and out of the community. It helps the less privileged towards dignity and self-confidence. So again, like those concepts of empowerment that we also saw in uh, the human rights-based approach. It makes for contact, enhanced understanding uh, between social classes and uh, between generations. So that to me is another way that we can bring that into practice. And so how does that look in um, the museum world? So I wanted to talk about some practical examples like I said before. So this is the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, which I had also the uh, opportunity to be part of the founding team and the, the team that developed the museum. Um, and this museum, very much like the one that we are here today, is also a museum that is based on issues. It's a museum it, that it was conceived as an ideas museum, right? like not around a collection of objects, even though there, are analog, there is an analog collection that holds artifacts, but the core of the collection is a digital collection. So it's a collection of oral histories. And we, the curators, together with community members, develop that collection going all across the country and traveling internationally to collect those stories. Um, so this is one example of, again, how can we use that technology and those uh, in oral history to create collections and to create exhibitions and programs. So this is an exhibition that I was very privileged to develop together with a group of indigenous women in Guatemala who survived the genocide from um, 1981 to 1983, although the war extended a lot longer than that. So again, this is one of those, um, you know, one of those genocides that uh, we have um, sort of looked at through the eyes uh, in, uh, through the eyes of the people who survived them, right? So like I said, uh, in this project, for example, um, I started engaging with uh, the women, um, earning the trust. I knew the women from before because even before working in the museum sector, I had worked in Guatemala, so I already had a relationship that I had developed, that I had developed with them, so I didn't have to just jump and try to extract those stories, which again, it's problematic and it's unethical when we just try to jump into a community, take those stories and make them into an exhibition. So in this case, um, it took a long time to build that relationship of trust. It took trips again uh, back and forth uh, to Guatemala. But uh, some of the important things in here, as I think that are uh, to highlight in terms of the work that we do in decolonizing museums, is that, for example, the messaging, this was a, this was a um, virtual reality film that we developed together. So the messaging that came from uh, that film came from the women. So we together worked that. So it was uh, what the women wanted to relate to the public that, were, that we were able to see. So we had to leave the curatorial approach, the messaging and everything flexible so it could change and it could adapt what their needs were. And it was also important for us to be able to go back to Guatemala and to show the stories because a lot of times, and this the women told us, uh, many researchers had come into the community, taken their stories, gone uh, back to their homes and never come back and never tell them how they used their stories. So that was something that was really important. All the um, exhibitions that we did at the museum were English and French, 
and this one was the only one that was done in English, French, and Spanish. So we could also bring it, even though the n you know, native uh, language of many of the women was in Spanish, but it was the one that they understood. So we could, again, also um, be able to let them know how the stories had been used. They, were, they also came to the opening of the museum, uh, sorry, of the exhibition, and they were the ones who also spoke at uh, the exhibition and told the story. So it wasn't me as the curator speaking and presenting the story. It was them telling their own story because it wasn't my story to tell. Uh, so this is what the exhibition looked like, and that's uh, the virtual reality film as well. So yeah, it, it was uh, really amazing to be able to do that. And of course, this exhibition opened uh, in 2016, so it was a long time ago, uh, and things have you know changed, and I would do things differently now, but. Uh, this was, again, one of those uh, projects. So this is another project as well, which I developed with the Rohingya community in Canada. And uh, earlier we heard uh, as well during our tour that Aung San Suu Kyi had been removed from the exhibitions here. So that also happened at the Human Rights Museum. We also had Aung San Suu Kyi in our uh, exhibitions. But um, the Rohingya community started to arrive in Canada in the 1990s. So there are lots of fam Rohingya families around Canada and there were also families in the city where the museum is located. So when they were coming through the museum and they would see uh, the image of Aung San Suu Kyi represented as a human rights icon, uh, there was a lot of retraumatization again that they will be exposed to. So they approached the museum and they asked us to remove that image and they asked us as well, as well to represent that story, their story in the museum. So there is, as a response, the museum decided to do a um, photographic exhibition. Um, it was a Canadian photographer who went to, um, he was based in China, um, and during the, one of the waves of the violence, uh, the one that started in 2017 in August, he jumped in the plane and he started taking photos of the exodus of uh, the Rohingya community going to the refugee camps in Bangladesh, which is now the largest ref refugee camp in the world. Um, so again, it was someone who wasn't from the community who was taking these images, and the museum had decided unilaterally to present the story of the Rohingya community not from their perspective, but from someone outside. So to me, that was a little, bit, it was another ethical dilemma and another ethical challenge. So I volunteered to become the curator and um, I started to travel all across the country and asking the community how they wanted the story to be told. And I, re I presented to, I, I, I showed them the photos that the museum wanted to develop the exhibit with. And they said that the exhibits were important to show, sorry, the, the, the photos were important to show, but they only told one side of the story. And that was the story of victimization. And they didn't want to be only represented as victims because they also had a culture, they had um, poetry, they had uh, music, and they wanted all of that to be represented in the exhibition and not just them as fleeing uh, their country. So we developed an oral history project as well that was, uh, again, all the questionnaire was developed by the community, with the community. Um, they selected the people who were going to be interviewed to do the oral history project. Even them, you can see in the images that it wasn't me as the curator conducting the interviews. It was the community as well doing the interviews, most of them. And so we travel all across the country. We also share uh, food. We develop, again, those relationships of trust, which is in, 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 which is really, really important to do when we're developing this, uh, this type of projects. It's always about trust, and it's always keeping that trust even after the project has been completed. So all of these people, for example, uh, they're my friends, and I continue to talk to them even today because it's not like we just jump into a project and we disappear, right? That's not ethical. So again, um, the last project, well, that's sort of like the gallery and how it looks like. Uh, we use, actually in this one, we use, uh, before I go into the next one, that's what I forget, we use um, artificial intelligence for this exhibition. So the oral histories provided us with the content, and then from that content, we were able to use uh, the software for the artificial intelligence to respond to questions that people would ask uh, when they were going through the gallery. And you can also see the different photographs. We, bought, we also brought photographs from the community, so it wasn't just the photographs from the um, external photographer that we presented. Again, to be able to uh, decenter whiteness from this exhibition and to try to decolonize it in that way as well. Um, and so this is the uh, last example that I wanted to talk about from the Human Rights Museum, and it is um, an exhibition that we use uh, augmented reality uh, to show the stories uh, behind uh, arpilleras. So arpilleras are these uh, textiles that were created by women 
in Chile during uh, the Pinochet dictatorship, and they tell many different stories of resistance. And this in particular tells, tells the story of Carmen Gloria Quintana, who became an icon of freedom and resistance in Chile. And she was a student, she was 18 years old, when she was uh, burned alive by uh, the military, and she survived, and she became, uh, like I said, a very uh, strong voice protesting uh, the dictatorship. So her story is in that uh, arpillera that you see there. So you see the artwork, and what we did is that we also conducted oral histories with the community. We did oral histories with her. She also had two more arpilleras that told her story at home, but they were really valuable to her, so she would not uh, allow the museum to have them. So what we did is that we went there with uh, very special cameras to take you know, um, the images that could really get into all of the nitty gritty and the details and everything that was you know, in the textile. And when people would walk into the gallery, they, would, they were able to put either their phone or their iPad in front of the piece, and then you would, a you would able to pick up like the other arpilleras that were at her home and also see other sides of the story and also pieces of the oral history. So that's kind of how we um, use technology in that respect as well, working together with uh, that community and with Carmen Gloria Quintana. Um, and the last example then uh, that I also wanted to talk about is uh, the example of the Swedish Museum of uh, Movements. And that was a project that um, originated in Sweden um, in 2015. And it was a project, again, that was supposed to be a national museum of migration and democracy um, that would also center uh, community voices, that would put community voices at the center of the project in all of the decisions that were uh, going to be made. In uh, Scandinavia, like uh, Jos uh, told us, it's very hard to talk about decolonization because it depends as well with the context where you are in the places. For example, if you're in Kansas State, so Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and the US, it's easier to talk about decolonization. But if you are, for example, in Northern Europe or in the Global South, it's easier to talk about human rights, which again is one of the reasons why I use human rights museology to bring you know this work, which at the end of the day sort of like is about uh, prioritizing this historically excluded voices. So this is something that, again, that I was able to use in Sweden to prioritize um, historical, historically excluded voices together with the team that was working at the museum. So what you see there is a space that uh, we opened in uh, the heart of Malmo, in a neighborhood that is very multicultural, that was 600 square feet uh, not 600 square meters, um, and we had an exhibition space, we had a kitchen because people wanted to use that kitchen to tell uh, their stories and to do programming, um, and uh, we also provided a space for artists to be able to present their work. And so, what, like I said, what we wanted to do was really to center those community voices that had been excluded from the past, and those voices that live in the colonial difference, right, that even though Sweden did not acknowledge uh, that colonial past, we were still able to bring them into the work of the museum. One of the things that um, it's important to talk about as well is the ethics of all of the work that comes around with oral history. So every time that, you know, like I talked about many people who uh, have experienced trauma, that have uh, survived genocide, and so many of these people, when you are asking them for the stories, they might be re-traumatized. There might be so many um, ethical issues that happen and that take place because of the oral history or the exhibition. So we need to make sure that we have strong ethical frameworks. And this is something that we did not work very much at the Human Rights Museum. So already had their experience. We did work with ethical principles, um, and each curator had their own, but there was nothing that was standard for the museum. And that's something that, to me, was important when I came into this project in Sweden, which was to develop those ethical guidelines from the beginning, and to develop them uh, not just from the museum and from the people working in the museum, but to develop them with historically marginalized people and experts who have been working in this, people who come from these communities. So in this project, what we did is that we brought um, 35 different experts, and when I talk about experts, I talk about community experts, academics, and museum professionals. So we valued the, exp the expertise at the same level, and it was people who came from the neighborhood, uh, from the city of Malmo, from Sweden at large, and from all around the world. So we had people from every continent. So we have people from New Zealand, we have people from Australia, from South Africa, from South America, all coming together from all these different uh, communities that have not had a chance to participate in these processes to tell us how they wanted us to do this ethically. Uh, and again, this is another way of uh, decolonizing uh, museum practice and also to do it around uh, digital collection because this collection was also going to be a collection of oral histories. 
um, the project uh, stopped receiving funding uh, last year, uh, but it has sort of, and again, there's a lot of different challenges, the political challenges that we can talk about, you know, when you try to central, uh, to, to um, prioritize historically excluded voices, and particularly in the context of a national museum, we also faced a lot of that in Canada, but in the case of Sweden, it was stronger uh, pressure, and so the project, like I said, stopped being funded uh, yet last year. And uh, since then, the communities who have been involved in this project have um, sort of morphed into different projects. And now the oral history project continues alive and is taking a different shape. And so that's really interesting because it's going into uh, Malmo University. Malmo University continues to work with many of the people who were involved in this project. And uh, I think I will leave it at that. And thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Armando. And now I would like to ask all our speakers to join me <laughs> for the discussion. Uh, and I would like to remind to our online speakers that they can join us uh, in person <laughs> by, uh, by clicking on the Zoom link. There is no need of registration. Uh, or they can ask questions uh, in the chat. Uh, OK, so let me start. Uh, I think we had a very good overview of, of how somehow technology is maybe not at all, but the driving force of what is happening in museums right now and on very various levels, because Lukasz was talking about the traditional art museums <laughs> in it, yes. Uh, Jos was talking about uh, colonial collections, and you were talking a bit about, like, let's say, the museum of the present, of the future, uh, the museums that are being really made. Uh, and so this is for, for one. Uh, and uh, what you are talking about, I think, it's, uh, I was quite, quite fascinated uh, that you can have uh, this uh, heritage science, if applied, it, ca it can really bring the museum to a totally <laughs> new, a different level. And I was really uh, fascinated by this issue of algorithms <laughs> and was wondering if we will have soon a museum made by algorithms <laughs> and by neuroscientists. <laughs> And uh, so, so this is like a really different level. This is, uh, I think, uh, still not well known <laughs> to like museum curators. Uh, I think it should be known. So because I stopped myself on uh, Gombri <laughs> and, and uh, yes, and I and illusion, and really it has moved so much forward. So this is like uh, what Lukas said, I think, and I'm just very much wondering about the future. And what Jos showed, uh, our well, our come back to this issue of Polish decolonizing <laughs> later because it, like, it, 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 it uh, really deserves a parenthesis. Uh, I think you showed what is very important is how to use uh, digitization. You were talking, you, you were talking more about very uh, advanced technical computing <laughs> technologies and you were talking about digitization. We are thinking about digitization mainly as access. Uh, wide access everywhere. And you were talking that you can use it in a wide, wise way. And you were showing, I think you were showing many good practices and like pitfalls where it won't work at all. And what I liked very much is that, uh, and this is absolutely, because you could make all this talk about Poland because of digitization, because you could find that the Nin had on the, on the uh, Stetsi Museum, maybe it was not done in the really right way because it was not with a scientific background, which is so important. So. We, don't, you don't not you don't you shouldn't only share the image the object, but also the knowledge that is uh, like this archive, as you said. And what I like very much that from this digitization projects, I think this is very important. You can build cooperations. It's building cooperation, sharing knowledge, and uh, it's not only about restitutions. It's also about knowing about the objects, knowing about each other, knowing about how we are. Um, what are our needs, uh, what we know about heritage, uh, and how we are different in these different perceptions. And Armando, uh, you, you, you showed us a totally new, different way, uh, let's say a new path for museums, uh, which is this uh, oral history, which is becoming uh, very, very popular right now, thanks to the digital means. It's not so expensive, it's easy to, to make, although, as you said, uh, you need to have all these ethical <laughs> issues behind your head. Uh, and uh, it's at, I was thinking it's, it's like it's a totally different museology. I think it's not, it's very much about your also Latin roots. It's a, a very much Latin museology, uh, which is so different from the Western one. Um, and um, 
I was thinking about the possibilities of applying it also here in Poland, maybe not uh, only about, uh, well, a more conscious youth of oral history and like uh, more showing it <laughs> on exhibitions and so on. And I really liked uh, this, um, this very important issue, which is very important right now and very important also in narrative museums, this community involvement. It's so important. And uh, oral history and the history of this uh, Malmo project uh, that despite the lack of financing it's going on, it shows that maybe we are going into the era when uh, communities will be uh, making, uh, well, will, will be like shaping again, uh, we are coming back from the temple back to the origins when we communities, people were shaping uh, museums like how they see their past and so on. But what is also very important, and all three like papers showed it, like it's the importance of experts behind it. Like uh, uh, you cannot just leave it like this. <laughs> you cannot leave it to a flow. <laughs> you cannot just leave it to social media and to because we are talking so much about giving access to heritage and uh, people enjoying heritage. We, there is a need of guidance, and as this, this really was uh, repeated very much and very often. Dialogue, <laughs> dialogue, understanding, uh, and, and, and respect. So I think this was a very, very good introduction. I really thank you very much for it. And I would like to ask you, like my question is the future. <laughs> How to go on <laughs> for all of you? <laughs> yes, yes. Is it on? Yes. So I think in heritage science field, I think that future is in front of us because it's very new discipline. It was created 15 years ago and the term, and, and I think we are slowly but continuously developing. And I think that there is a very clear link, particularly with the yours presentation, maybe not about the application of the, of the modern technologies to, to traditional museums, but also to the aspect of the colonization, but maybe even more importantly, to illicit traffic. There are already built technologies which allowed for the crowdsourcing, the documentation of objects which have been stolen from, from many places and to identify them in the American or European museum. So this is absolutely very important. The second technology which somehow links us with particularly me with, me with yours is also satellite imaging of the pitfalls due, uh, due to illegal excavation in Iraq, in, in Syria, and so on. So I think, from my point of view, I think that, of course, there is some conflict, but there is also opportunity and challenges to, to collaborate within, between the discipline. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask you a question? Because I, I was reading the title Heritage Science, and I was excited. And as far as I have to do with heritage and science, it's usually critical heritage, heritage studies. But science and is, is there a link between the two? I think that, so, sorry, for me the link is obvious. So we are, so applying, we are applying the scientific tools, the tools typical for the natural sciences, for engineering like IT technologies or for the life sciences, for experimental psychology, to answer the questions which are posed by the humanities. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, we need these tools and, and, and we are focused on the question, hum, questions posed by the humanities. Okay. For the time being. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you agree? Uh, no, I'm just thinking about it. I thought, you know, Critical heritage studies is more is anthropology, is history, is archaeology, all these uh, gamma studies. And yours is rather, it's almost mathematic. It's, I mean, it's fascinating, you know, how you observe people observing a painting, for instance. And I thought, we are, how do we link the two? I, I use always, or frequently I use the, the analog with the, the health sciences or the protection of the health. So on one hand, the philosophers, the psychologists, the, or humanists can speak about the quality of the, of the life, can, they can speak about the nature of the human being. But on the other hand, when we are trying to save, to protect the human life, 
at certain point, we need to start to use technology. If, if you have individual patient, you can use, uh, you can use the, the individual approach, you can have a specialist who helps that uh, to, to, to save this life. But when we are dealing with management of the large number of people, as we had during the COVID, you have to have a model to save the largest number of people. And without numbers, without quantified models, which we quantitative answers, we cannot do that efficiently. Mm -hmm. And at certain point, just the, uh, let, let's say, intuitive based approaches are not intuitive, but the descriptive approaches are not enough. You need numbers yep. to, to, okay. to effectively challenge the problem. Okay. I want to get back to uh, your question about the future. And I think um, at least uh, in the side of the world where I am right now, the issue is about making museums relevant and making them relevant to society and to people. Particularly, you just mentioned uh, the COVID-19 crisis, right? With the COVID-19 crisis, we realized that many museums have failed those who have been the most vulnerable. They have not really opened those doors. They have not made themselves relevant. So when all these museums closed the doors, uh, many of them were asking for funds from governments to like, you know, be able to continue to keep afloat. But at the same time, we were sort of asking the question is like, why would you receive all these funds to continue going if you've only been serving one part of society, if you've only been serving elites, right? And so I think to me, it's really thinking, and, and the paper that I sort of presented, I wrote it before the pandemic. So before, so if, you know, otherwise I would have prepared something different, but, um, you know, I started to see how museums are shifting and around the world, right? And museums are shifting towards really working closer and closer to their communities because that is what's going to m keep them relevant. Um, I'm working, as you said uh, earlier, with uh, museums in Colombia, and for example, uh, Museum Casa de la Memoria, which is a small museum in Medellin, what they did with the pandemic is that they actually became the link between the municipal government and the communities because they had those relationships with the communities they had built before. So they could go and sort of figure out what the needs of the communities were during the pandemic, bring them back to the government, and then uh, they would uh, be able to respond to them. So for example, they were, um, the museum staff were trained at hospitals how to prevent um, the spread of the pandemic, and they will bring that to the different neighborhoods and the different communities. Uh, they were bringing food as well for the people who couldn't go out and work, because if you can't work uh, you know, in many places in Latin America that day, you cannot eat, right? So they would bring that. So the museum became a warehouse where they would have all the food and they would take it you know, out to the communities. Um, they were also uh, working with people experiencing homelessness, and so they were bringing them to shelters that were built for them. So this is, to me, the future of museums, right? And, and it is, yes, uh, we're talking about technology, but to me, I think, is we need to go back to our societies and how museums can serve our people first, and then we can start thinking about everything else. And there's so much that, yeah, we can do, obviously, with technology, but we need to think about our people first, I think. Yeah, a, f a few things. Um, first, about the role of communities you were talking about, Armando. I like that very much. But what I see in, say, in the, um, so you're talking basically about settler colonies, you know, where Europeans went and they started to dominate within the frontiers of one country. And I'm talking more about distance colonies, you know. And, but what I see that in the provenance research, there is a growing recognition of the role of communities in the provenance research. Mm -hmm. And just to give one example, I remember a colleague of mine, a historian, he went with a picture of such a Nile statue, a, a, a power statue, to Congo. And he showed it to the people. And, and the, 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 it was an object in the in a museum in Europe. He showed it to the people, and some of the people, they started to cry. And the picture, the object had been taken in 1878. So it had been away for 150 years or so but people still remembered it, and they said, it's ours. And then it turned out that, you know, the people also, they remember that the chief of the community had asked the, the, the European colonizer, please leave it here, because it's ours and we need it. They still knew that. Now, that's very essential information in provenance research. You know, so you see that, and um, 
I also see it in, um, well, in other places very differently, these communities, but I know that, for instance, in the relationship between the Netherlands and Indonesia, in Indonesia there were sultanates, and so there were princes. They lost war booty, precious words, diamonds, etc. They want to have them back. Now, what role do you give to that sort of communities? Yeah, but we were talking earlier over lunch, remember, um, as well about um, the role of communities exactly in provenance. And we talked about, uh, for example, the Haida Nation in Canada, which, you know, we talked about like that, uh, the booklet that has been uh, created, uh, the guide um, to sort of work on that. And, and we talked about exactly how this community has been going all around the world trying to bring back those ancestors. Like you said, it doesn't matter if it's been 200 years, 300 years. Yeah. When you bring them back, it's the ancestors. So, of course, it's emotional, right? And they they have worked very much in creating and developing these processes to educate museum professionals around the world. Why is so important? Why is so painful? And I think that's again, like it's going back to those communities because those communities, and it's again what the report from the UN says, right? These processes need to be led by the communities. Yeah. And jointly, of course, with governments, because we need to look at all of the, you know, legal um, implications that we have in each country is different, and we have to involve all of that. But they have to be led by those communities, and I think that's exactly where we coincide as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if I may return to the question of the challenges, yeah. I would like also to, to draw your attention to the uh, changing role or, or way of action of the museums in in the future of the global climate change. I think it's completely unsustainable that uh, thousands of people are flying all over all the world to see the Mona Lisa. I think it's not sustainable, it cannot be, we cannot continue in this way. And because I'm the representative of the sciences which are interested and we can answer only the question about the, the material, about the matter, uh, I of course would like to, to say that when I think about the museums, and when you look at the statistics of ICOM, 97% of objects are in the storages. Mm -hmm. Why they should, I think, travel, they should travel to people because it's much more cheaper and spending the time in the museum is a very sustainable way if you are not flying from Japan to Paris, of course. Uh, and I think it, we, we, sh we should change that, that way of thinking or operation in, in, in Poland, in Europe, and globally, that objects could go to the communities which are, which are less privileged, not the large cities with the perfect galleries, very well equipped and with the perfect, uh, the prime objects, but this collection should be shared with the, with the less uh, privileged communities as well. And to do that, we need, the scientists need to understand better the sensitivity, vulnerability of objects to, to climate variation because the standards, as I have shown, uh, on the energy consumption, if you want to have the perfect museum, we, we will use a lot of energy first. And the uh, museums in the less uh, developed countries or, or less developed regions will never can get to that point. But on the other hand, most of these objects were stored for the centuries in the completely uncontrolled environment and there is a lot of arguments that objects, historic objects, doesn't need so stable conditions as we previously thought. Yeah, there, there's a contradiction, it's very interesting the point you raised, Lucas, but there is also a contradiction because I'm involved in this restitution issue and my thought is first of all the countries of origin or the communities of origin what do they think about it? Yeah. And now let me give an example that, you know, there's gold from a community in South America somewhere is in European museums. They want to have it back. And do you know what they want to do with it? They want to put it back in the graves. Yeah. Now what do you do with that? And then what, what, is, what, is, what is then priority? Is it science yeah. or the community of origin? I think it's a rhetoric question. I cannot answer this question. Well, but I, I will rhetoric, you can easily answer it. <laughs> <laughs> but I will, I will ask you, because of course you talk about the restitution of object. What about the information? What about the research results? To whom they believe they belong to? To the global community, to all of us, or to the local communities? Well, that, that, that is, thanks to the new technologies, much mm. easier. Because it belongs to all of us. 
What, what, what do you think I'm on? Well, I think that's an interesting question as well, right? Because exactly, it depends. When you talk with communities, and because and I think museums have this obsession with preserve things forever, right? And again, like talking about like, they, do, do that's they belong? That's not possible. No but, no, but it's the obsession with museums, right? And it's like, do they belong to humanity or not? But when you talk sometimes with different communities, there are communities who will tell you the object has a lifespan and an object, or you know, like I said, a belonging or an ancestor. Um, and some of these belongings, they don't need to, they're not meant to be preserved for hundreds of years. They meant to go back, like you said, to the land. They meant to like, you know, you know, sort of like accomplish their function and then be destroyed. And that is the right of the community, right? Because again, it belonged to that community. And if it was looted and if it was that, so then it should go back to that community and that community should be able to decide what to do with that. But what with the information? For example, if you have human uh, uh, remains and you make some genetic uh, research and you co collect information about genetic code, what to do with the information? Should we erase it from our hard disk? Or it's an important question, I think, because it, rem remains and the, the looted artifacts, there is no question about that. But the information is much more complicated for me. Personally, I was working and and I know that, the, for example, the, the artists who created the objects, they have the rights to the image of the, of, uh, of the object, but is it the same with the, I don't know, some FTR spectra or X-ray or, or some other research results? There is no legal answer to that. Well, there is, it depends on all the countries, right? But for example, in uh, the Sami communities right now, they're actually working with that particular issue because the human remains or like the ancestors, right? They've also been taken, they've been taking uh, DNA samples and they're asking for, when they're asking for restitution, they're asking not only for the ancestors, but also all of the materials and all the research that has been taken from them because it was taken with no consent. And at the end of the day, that is the issue, right? That there's no consent. Let me ask you, I mean, to raise the issue, eh? not to make it more difficult for you, but um, this question, you know, what should happen with the information, with the documentation? My first feeling is we should be careful with it and keeping it. But I would also like to challenge you, what do you do if a community says, we want the information to be erased? Yeah. What do you do then? And you know, it was stolen from a community. I need help now. <laughs> you need help. <laughs> now just let's together you look at find it. It's here. not <laughs> creating contradictions. You, you know, know I, I think I think that for example, I, I have but maybe I'm in the Western culture, but but I think that the information that the objects they 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 belong not only to the community, but they belong to all, all the, to humanity. But, well, but information Mar Mar is you also had a some value of, at the end, it's a different value of the information, so <laughs> it's, yes, but it's I complex. But I, you know, I also would like to know, would, because I can imagine that many communities will say, yes, let's keep it, let's be careful with it. You know, I, I gave the very simple example of Belgium and Rwanda, that Rwanda says, you keep the originals, because you're better in keeping originals than we are at the moment. That, but that's a very simple example. So I wonder whether it's really a problem. And when I was at the Yale University, there was a legal problem of the cuneiform tablets uh, stolen from Iraq and so on, and they were seized by the, by the, um, I think the FBI. Mm, no FBI, I think Coast Guard Control or, or, yeah. or from, yeah. <coughs> the Border Control, and therefore the time being they were given to the Yale University and there was a case at the court and, and generally the, the objects had to be returned to the, to the Iraq and of course most probably the object would be destroyed. So the, my colleagues from the Yale University, they were considering two mega copies or, or to document them illegally to preserve the information acting against the law. So I don't know what's the answer but I think, I think the objects are the properties of the of the humanity. Um, I think it's not for us to decide these issues. Mm. I think it's for the communities to decide. Um, but it is. Can I, <laughs> it is? Can I give sure. a, a positive example? 
Marius, maybe, maybe Marius, excuse me, we cannot maybe, hear uh, you. Yes, uh, okay. because we, we can go on with okay. this discussion. I would just give uh, the voice to the public, both online and on site. So please, if you have questions, comments, may I? Yes, yes, of yes. course. Uh, my name is Anna Mdlarska. I'm responsible for documentary films uh, archives here in uh, the European Solidarity Center. We have over 1,400 interviews, video interviews, so it's not oral history, but rather visual history. And uh, we were trying to build something that would be, of course, in a way, a human, or, uh, human rights uh, archive, giving um, chance to speak to the, uh, both the leaders and the rank and file members of Solidarity from various backgrounds. And uh, the, the idea of preserving those stories uh, is very much a digital story, and we hope that we would be able to keep it for eternity. It's definitely the, the idea, as usual, with the archive. And the fact is that the very greatness of the collection, that it's still growing, and in fact, you have to renew it constantly. So there are costs, an immense costs of upkeeping that, that sort of files, but we are also documenting everything that's going on in our museum. So our collection, digital collection, is now 115 terabytes of video material, and uh, including many heroes of solidarity and very prominent events, uh, including uh, very modern stories. And um, what is crucial from our perspective is our, first of all, right to keep it, <laughs> and our right to preserve it, and resources to, to, to have it. And I think it's very interesting, so, somehow it goes in all the direction, even in your direction, because we are keeping full biographies, so including periods when some of the heroes of solidarity were uh, sent to very remote regions of our world, to Siberia or to German concentration camps, when their lives were, were destroyed by mass shooting like in December 1970. And we have uh, also stories of the relatives of people who were killed in the Stalinist times or during the World War II, both by Soviets and by uh, German, uh, Nazi Germany at that time. So we have lots and lots of stories like that and we want to preserve them and we want to show them to the public and it's a great, another great problem, how to show them, how to make them all accessible it's again enormous cost, enormous effort to, to do that. We are now part in, of the international project called The Other Europe, where um, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Czech, Czechs and Slovaks, but with the interviews from former Czechoslovakia uh, and Poland, are working together to show about 100 or 200 interviews, which are short interviews about up to half an hour uh, done for the uh, British film in 1987-1988, so before the fall of the Iron Curtain. And it's enormous effort to do the, that handful of interviews. And we have, as I said, more than 1,400 interviews. So how to make them accessible, how to translate them all to make them at least accessible in English, but that's, again, it's not enough. So there is that enormous um, problem for the international museum community, how to make things accessible. Not everyone is speaking just one language, yes? So we, and Polish language is not widely spoken around the world, so we have to uh, translate virtually everything. You asked about translating, you know, uh, the collections of the, uh, from the colonial, uh, colonial period. And uh, it's an enormous task to do the, the translation job and then to make it, as you know, tec from technological perspective, to make it uh, accessible. I think we need 
much more effort at collaboration in that because no single museum or cultural institution like our institution can do it on its own. How do you see the perspective for working together uh, in that purpose? It's a question for, to all of you. And of course, I'm also very much interested in the object, but I'm not a specialist in that, uh, in that field, although I have a very strong personal interest because my late husband was a painter, an artist, so the questions were very, very important from, from my private perspective. Thank you all very much. It was a very interesting session, and I would like you to answer that. How do you see the collaboration of the, of the institutions to preserve this digital data and how to make them accessible to everyone? To what languages we should translate it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, that is exactly the dilemma that we have with all these collections, right? I mean, working at the Human Rights Museum, I think the time that I left, I think we had maybe around 500 oral histories. Um, and it was the same issue. It's like, how do you make them accessible? How do you translate them? Because everything had to be English and French there, and right? And to make them accessible to everyone we could, and, and we didn't have the funds. And the museum over there received like $27 million a year in funding from the government. And even like that, with that money, you, would, you, you don't have enough money to be able to do it, right? I think you have the answer there, which is collaborations. We can do it all on our own. Um, and I would love to see more, more museums, universities, archives coming together um, and create these big projects, right? Like, you know, really, m you know, important projects to be able to make, to make these um, collections accessible to all. Uh, there's so many other issues, like ethical dilemmas with that too, because for example, um, in that museum, what we did is that we would get the oral history but in the release form, the museum wouldn't get the property of the oral history. Uh, we would get a kind of use of fructus, so we could use the oral history, but the property would always stay with the person that you know gave us the story, which makes it more complicated because then when they they die, who does it go to the you know the heirs or does it go to the museum? The problem with why we did that is because the museum is a national museum and whatever goes into that collection, and you had issues here with that as well, right, with uh, the government or whoever gives the public funds wanting to come and get in those collections because, because it belongs to the government. So we did that to protect uh, the stories from uh, the people. So Because there's another example, for example, in Colombia, the National Museum of Historic Memory, they also collected lots of oral histories from all these people that you know trusted them with the stories. There was a change of government. The government took the museum and they took the collection and they started using all those interviews to further their own agenda, right? So all of these things can happen and there's many ethical issues that can happen and there's no answers to that. So yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry I don't have an answer for your questions, we're at, you know, which are excellent and I think all of us are asking the same questions. Is how do we do this? How do we move forward together in this, this sort of oral history world? I have also some opinion about that. I think that it's the most important is to collect the oral histories because technology develops so fast that in the future you will not will have to translate them. There will be the, the algorithm or the artificial intelligence who will do that. So the most important is to collect. And, and uh, perfect. And regarding the objects tangible, I th agree, agree, totally agree with Armando that that assumption that we can pass all objects with, which are unchanged to the next generation is absolutely false conviction. We cannot do that. We have to select because, because select what we want to commemorate and what we want to keep for the young generation because the cost of keeping of that, of all, of all objects, is just too high. It's too high for the environment. And, we, and museums, in, in fact, they are not consciously, they are not saying that, but the most precious objects they keep in the best condition, and the less they are, let's say, informally accessing because they deteriorate so quickly. So I think it's not, the role of the museum is not to keep everything, or generally the, the, the role or, or the society has the right to keep something, not everything. And what museums do, they are managing the collection managing the change, but they are not preserving everything for eternity. Have uh, any other questions, ideas? I, uh, if you want, you are online, you can join through Zoom. <laughs> uh, 
Well, I, I think that no museum around the world will ever have a will ever face the situation that they will have a chance to uh, preserve everything. I think the museums well, always, we're always struggling, are struggling and will struggle with finding suitable material to preserve for the future. I wouldn't worry about that. I wouldn't worry about the consequences of keeping too much because there are very few museums in around the world who which really have too much in their storerooms. I think most of the museums rather would like to have too much than not enough. I, I do agree that it's not possible to keep the stuff forever. It will, one way or another, go disappear. But then I really, agree, I, I really think that we should do everything possible to keep it alive as long as possible. Thank you. As a museum. Worker, <laughs> but but uh, how do you balance the cost, environmental cost, the the preservation? It has a cost, so I'm absolutely not saying that that what we should do, but definitely the conflict between preservation and the cost exists. And if we are conscious about that, the better. What is the decision? I don't know. But we sh the sustainability is not about applying the green any technology. It's about the neg negotiation between conflicting needs. I don't think we need that. Uh, Ray, do you have any microphone? I, I, I seriously think that we do not have enough of of the heritage in our possession. There are still many questions which we cannot answer because we do not have evidence what happened in the past. I don't know, uh, I come from very industrial region of Silesia, and we, I think there are some, let's say, industrial processes we cannot fully explain today because we don't really know how our ancestors actually did the stuff. So uh, well, I believe that we should keep as much as possible preserve it, you know, care for it as much as we can, regardless of the cost. We Museums never have enough money, by the way. We know that all. And I don't think we reach that point that we should really worry about that, that we, for example, we, we f fill up our storerooms and we'll have nothing, no space left. There is still ahead of us. Maybe, as I said, in 100 so, years. So I don't agree with you. Unfortunately, I don't agree with you because I think that we are facing the problem there, are, there, there is a first case in Canada when the museum was yeah. closed and the collection was the access because of the, yeah. of the not meeting the environmental standards. Uh, secondly, maybe, okay, I will not damage my reputation, but when I work at the, uh, more, of course, because, but uh, when I was working at the National Museum in Krakow, which is the, one of the, the most, the prime museum in Poland, with the Leonardo painting and so on. We got the, the grant from the European Commission, oh sorry, not from the Norway grants, to um, renovate Cloth Hall, which is one of the most important buildings in, 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 uh, in Poland. And air conditioning system was installed, but it had to be switched off because there was no money to run it. It was very real problem and when the, when all the small museums will install HVAC systems because they want to have a better condition for the preservation of works of art, they will not be able to pay the bill. This is very real problem. This is not. Yeah, I understand. I understand what you're saying, but I think that we, we're talking about different things because my, as, 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 as I can see, you're talking about lack of money in a, in a heritage industry. Uh, maybe when our governments will prioritize the spending better, maybe that will be doable, I think. Maybe when we start putting so much money, I don't know, as uh, civilization, as humanity, into armaments and all that stuff, maybe then we will understand that the money can be spent better. Obviously, uh, this is just rambling very, now. Very optimistic point of view. <laughs> 
but I agree. because I for agree. example let's imagine that we in the green deal new green deal which is which is now accepted by european union we have to reach the climate neur neutrality in 2050 it, it cannot be done with improving energy efficiency of historic buildings, which means that the preservation of the original substance is in conflict with the energy efficiency. But it's a little bit further from the museum, so, <laughs> but maybe we can discuss it later. But we have to remember that we are discussing it in a country where works of art were burned on purpose and collections and data were burned during the World War II and we are still in a position that we want to preserve all we have because we are not having as much as we used to have in the 20s or 30s before the World War II. So after such losses from the point of view of human rights, yes, we have that feeling that our collections are precious, more precious than you might think in any other country. And also we have not still got back what we have lost, what was stolen by the occupying forces, both from the East and from the West. Those works have not returned fully to Poland yet. So I think we are in a very special position. And if we are talking that now for environmental reasons, we will resign from part of our heritage. It's probably very strongly felt the way you feel it, and I share your feeling fully, I think that, that. And it's the same with our collection, which is very recent, very new. We started it in 2008, but it, those are things from the 70s and 80s, but we would like to preserve them forever. And I wait, 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 wait. Oh. Voice. <laughs> well, I come from a museum that really wants to preserve everything because I work at the Auschwitz Memorial and actually every personal item we believe should be preserved and I understand all the challenge that the, from the muse museological point of view and the scientific point of view and environmental, there are plenty of things, but as you said, the technology change really quickly and this may be also the input of the heritage sciences that uh, to create new techniques. I mean, lighting that can be cheaper, air conditioning that can be cheaper, structuralizing global collections, warehouses that museums can share together. For example, to, to build one storage area, which is, so probably there are points of compromise and we still have time till 2050 or whatever year um, our governments will choose to get to the point of sustainability. So. Um, yes, I, I believe that the compromise is possible and the challenges are known. And there are museums that have too many, there are museums that have too few. I, re I remember there are places in the world where one shoe from the Auschwitz Memorial is the core of the exhibition and we have 110,000 shoes that we need to preserve. So it's, it's a huge challenge on, on many levels, but I think the, uh, your new science uh, can help us. Uh, the huge technological uh, giants like Google that collect all the data and then create projects that are accessible, they are using lots of energy to save, to store this data. They can also help. And I think this cooperation that we were talking about is Absolutely. happening right now. Mm. I think, I think I, I have to stop this discussion because I think we are, except this is a fascinating discussion, I think we are really earning for discussion. Uh, like face to face, finally, <laughs> and, um, but I think we have to stop, be a bit sustainable, to switch off the computers, <laughs> the speak computers. Thank you so much, thank you so much for today. Uh, it was really fascinating, <laughs> and I think we'll come back in the final discussion to many points which we have touched today, and I really invite you, everyone, uh, here and uh, online, for tomorrow at 10 o'clock we start. Have, have a nice evening, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.